The Sherman Antitrust Law was enacted in 1890 to fight this practice of secret price-fixing agreements. Antitrust meant anti-price-fixing. This law left companies no choice but to switch from secret agreements to public mergers. And beginning in the year 1895, there was merger frenzy. Many corporations were formed with the sole aim of immediate profit from the sale of stock. Our corporate leaders invented the merger as a way to reduce competition so that prices could be higher than occurs among numerous and competing proprietors. Large corporations could be built only in those industries where standardized, mass-produced goods could be produced, where machinery could replace labor, and where economies of scale were possible. To put an economy of scale into action required capital to buy machinery. The first scalable industries were these involving material and chemicals, but not these excluded industries which involved customized products made in small, constantly changing batches that could not be supervised by the corporate bureaucracy until more recently. As farmers bought factory-made implements, many local blacksmiths went out of business. They couldn't compete with the factories that were making cheaper, mass-produced items. Some blacksmiths moved their rural shop to the city to become machinists for the factories. Others remained in the country to become repair shops for these factory-made items. Still others became specialized in axes and such. Before there were railroads, we drove cattle from western states to market in eastern states. But cattle could lose 60% of the weight during this journey. Cattle drives were necessary because we could not ship processed meat for any distance. After railroads connected east and west, the cattle were instead shipped by railroad to be slaughtered in the east. Lick describes how Gustavus Swift moved his meat packing plant to Chicago in 1875 with bold plans to slaughter cows there while they were fat and then use cold northern winter railroad routes to send just their meat to the east. He set up a network of eastern outlets ready to sell this meat as soon as it arrived. In 1881 he also began to fill railroad cars with ice to be able to ship year round. He built refrigerated warehouses in the east to store meat for a short time. The meat packing industry created an assembly line in which the animal carcass was moved from one employee to the next, with each person carving a specific section. Henry Ford later copied this assembly line into his auto plant. Other food processing companies include Philip Armour, which began a meat packing company, and John Dorrance's Campbell Soup Company. Dorrance invented a process for condensing soup and storing it in newfangled tin cans that could be stored for long periods and transported over long distances. But he had to ask people to try their first ever canned meal. Beginning around 1830, railroad companies were the first businesses needing to invent through foresight and trial and error. A large-scale organization able to administer an extensive enterprise spread across hundreds of miles or kilometers. This is in contrast to business enterprises since Mesopotamian times, which operated in a single building and village. The planet's time zones were adopted to coordinate railroad schedules, and this was first done in Great Britain. Before time zones existed, every town had its own local noon when the sun was highest in the sky. A corporation that contains thousands of employees and is spread across several states needs a functioning system that, Licht explains, must consist of a basic sales strategy, specifies detailed tasks and responsibilities for each employee, sets up layers of authority among many levels of managers in an organizational scheme, separates administration from ownership, has a production system, a cost accounting system, and financial officers who track the internal flow of revenue specifies company rules and regulations, personnel practices, feedback, and forecasting methods. The yet larger corporations that followed took what the railroads had learned about large-scale organization and adapted and expanded it to manage business on a previously non-existent scale. 
At first, steam engines obtained their power by burning wood, but coal soon expanded the use of steam engines and enabled their size to be made larger. Larger steam engines enabled larger factories to be built, which in turn allowed corporations to exist. Licht explains that there is a direct relationship between coal, mass industry, and bureaucratic corporations. As corporations were growing in size, many industries continued to be family owned and operated, producing small batches of specialty goods, and were not involved in the flood of mergers that began around 1895. In 1880, the average factory in Philadelphia employed just 20 persons. Only five had more than 750 employees. The typical business structure continued to be sole proprietorships and partnerships. Large-scale corporations were less frequent, as they still are today. In 2017, the U.S. workforce numbers 160 million persons. Half are employed by companies having more than 500 employees and 15% by businesses having fewer than 20 employees. Corporate managers in manufacturing businesses tried to control the factory floor by defeating unions, increasing mechanization to replace expensive, skilled workers with unskilled persons, developing increasingly detailed divisions of labor, increasing supervision, adopting the standardization of parts, and using conveyor belt production techniques. It would offer benefits to encourage allegiance and discipline, set up career ladders to promote loyalty, and consolidate resources through corporate consolidation. The mergers of the 1890s resulted in large companies that could purchase expensive equipment such as that used in making steel. This steel making equipment required unskilled labor and so replaced many skilled workers and led to lower wages, union busting attempts by the corporation, and large scale strikes. The corporate managers also learned to influence politics and politicians in an attempt to steer away public and regulatory opposition to their existence. Many executives became as rich as only kings and queens had been. What was the role of the U.S. government in the industrialization of the nation? Licht explains that its largest roles were in acquiring land through international transactions such as the Louisiana Purchase, by taking land through war with Mexico, and enforcing native peoples onto reservations. In his book, The Spanish Frontier in North America, Weber explains that Spain claimed that the Louisiana Purchase involved a state-sized region from New Orleans to St. Louis, as shown, but the U.S. interpreted the Purchase to be the nation-sized region from New Orleans to the Montana-Canada border. The government surveyed and then sold these public lands to individuals and corporations, but more land went to the railroads than to homesteaders. Before the Civil War of 1861, the U.S. government played a minor role in economic development. The first and second U.S. banks developed fewer industries than did private funding. Telegraphs, canals, and railroads were mostly built with private funds. Education received less funding from government than from private sources until after 1860. Governmental tariffs helped to grow just a handful of industries, steel for example. In the year 1776, the political founders of the U.S. could not imagine that the nation would become a huge economic machine within the next century. To limit the power of the federal government, the founders restricted it from taxing luxuries, making bills on U.S. credit, or establishing national schools or research institutions and the founders gave states the right to grant licenses of incorporation. The founders said that no state could place obstacles to the flow of goods, people, or money across state borders. 
the federal government, not individual states, was to issue copyrights and patents to encourage trade. Lick says that the U.S. Constitution did not promote economic development, industrialization, or capitalism. It simply allowed them to occur. It was felt that if government were allowed to act, it would just grant monopolies to favored elites, as had been done by kings and queens. What was the role of the U.S. courts in promoting or restricting industrialization? The courts were usually more sympathetic with entrepreneurs and with creditors than with private individuals. For example, the court would more often side with the mill builders seeking access to a river rather than with the farmer who needed to irrigate a crop field. Consumers had little recourse when they found that they had purchased effective goods. Such fights between manufacturers and consumers continue today. The U.S. Constitution of 1789 called for a national uniform bankruptcy law, but none was passed until the 1860s because the court struck down every attempt. A final law was passed in 1893. Similarly, debtor's prison was not abolished until the 1830s. Employees assumed all risks for injuries on the job, placing the value of the product above the life of a human. The court showed that the fine print of a contract mattered more than did any ideas of fair practice. Since these court rulings sided with business over fairness, local communities had to pass laws for quality product standards and worker safety. Business leaders claimed that worker injuries were acts of God and not their fault. The debate was characterized as a fight over unliable businesses versus governmental intrusions. The U.S. government had to take on a new role in regulating business to require worker safety. After a roller coaster accident in the year 2015, one industry spokesman actually said that government regulations were not needed to ensure the safety of customers. He said that if many customers died at one park, then people would stop going there and that this would eliminate any unsafe park. But he did not state who would be jailed for the murders. Local courts were most often sympathetic to business owners and fought labor unions by considering them to be illegal attempts to restrict interstate trade. Legal protection for unions did not exist until the 1930s. In 1886, the courts ruled that since a corporation is a collection of citizens, it has all the same rights as a citizen. But the courts did not decide that a union is a similar collection of citizens. Mill said that the supremacy of corporate economic power began with this Supreme Court decision. The southern agricultural states stood in the way of most of the attempts of the northern industrial states to get the federal government to fund any expansion of northern industry. For example, southern legislators blocked the building of roads that were needed only in the north since the south had plenty of navigable rivers. But during the Civil War, the south was temporarily absent from the U.S. Congress and this allowed the northern states to get their way in passing the 13th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution, abolishing slavery, defining citizenship, due process and equal protection, and in establishing the preeminence of federal over state government. When the Civil War was over, the South returned to Congress and continued to block the growth of federal government. This is an example of government being either a blending of views or a single view. In chapter 19, we will see how democracy is a blending of views and priorities that partially satisfies all parties, and that an authoritarian government consists of a single party with its single view of priorities, outlawing all others. Do you want to have strong national government or strong state and local government? This change in governmental power relations of state versus federal preeminence played less role in reshaping the nation than did the rise of the corporation or the fight between labor and capital 
or the changes in government that came in response to the Great Depression. In review of industrialization and its societal consequences, our Industrial Revolution involved the related processes of industrialization, urbanization, commercialization, and capitalism in what Lick describes as the expansion of the marketplace to include the buying and selling of everything. Licht explains that the market society is as old as is the first farming villages. What changed with the emergence of our Industrial Revolution's factory was the pervasiveness of the market. Throughout the 1800s, there was much contemporary discussion about the increasing number of utensils and decoration in the home, the loss of help exchanges among neighbors of the community, the end of live-in apprentices and helpers who were treated as family members, and the conversion of society into one of cash exchanges, called business cycles driven by supply and demand and calculation. Business persons concerned for nothing but profits, child labor, and underpaid wage-earning laborers losing control over their own lives. The new merchant capitalists were not taking apprentices into their home as family members through several years of training. The wage earner was paying cash rent in one home and working in another building for cash wages. Through the first 10,000 years of farming and civilization, most everyone was a farmer and few persons were either rich or poor. In New York City of the 1890s, after just a few decades of industrialization not yet subject to the laws that it would necessitate, one-third to one-half of us were poor enough to be hungry, and one percent of us were forced to abandon our children. In his book, The Power Elite, sociologist C. Wright Mills explains that the growth of big government has been a late and reluctant response to the social consequences of our shift from farming to wage earning and the development of big business. Our initial government of farmers had to take on new functions as we became wage earning customers. Through the decades, government was forced to create programs for workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, housing regulations, labor laws, consumer protection, and retirement or Social Security. To pay for this, Congress passed the first graduated income tax in 1894, but the U.S. Supreme Court declared this direct tax to be unconstitutional. Minimum wage laws did not occur in the U.S. until 1938. The economic collapse of the Great Depression resulted in an expansion of government. Today, some of us complain about big business or big government as if the two were unrelated. If we did not have big business today, then we would not have big government. In the future, we'll both be greatly reduced as each person has a machine that will make any other machine, including vehicles and homes, and as transactions occur mostly between individuals rather than banks. Nothing about today's world of big business and big government makes any sense until we look at the changes in our way of life as we switch from being farmers to being wage-earning factory workers who not only made goods but purchased them too. We human beings have had just three ways of life. We human beings and our biological ancestors lived as gatherer-hunters for a few million years. Our civilization first began 10,000 years ago as a changing climate forced gatherer-hunters to become full-time farmers. Farmers became factory workers and began to live as industrialists for the last 250 years. We human beings have had only these three ways of life. Industrialization has greatly reduced community ties among neighbors. While some corporate leaders and commercials tell us that life is about money, people still obtain happiness only from other people. 
We are a social species. From the beginning of civilization until the year 1760 AD, most every business person was a sole proprietor. Prices could remain steady for centuries. Throughout the several thousand years of civilization prior to the development of the factory around the year 1760 AD, business consisted of craftspeople who made objects by hand one at a time. For example, one day's work might result in the production of one spoon, maybe two. These items were expensive and were sold only to the most wealthy of us, not to the general public which consisted of subsistence farmers. The home of each farmer contained only 20 possessions, including chairs, spoons, plates, cups, and a table, and these were of the lowest quality. Our homes were unpainted, had dirt floors and no windows. We often used sticks as forks and stumps as chairs. The business person lived and worked in the home. To sell items, a platform might be lowered in a window. The Industrial Revolution begins with the development of the factory around the year 1760. The first factories brought together into one building all the persons and steps needed to turn sheep hair into cloth. Later factories produce many types of things and bring low-cost items into the homes of the farmers. The number of items in the home increases from 20 to 200, including wallpaper, mirrors, glass windows, carpets, curtains, pictures, and paint. When the United States first became a nation, business consisted of nothing but craftspersons and sole proprietors who typically made a profit of 12% of their total sales. Each shop serves customers in a village-sized region having a 10-mile or 16-kilometer radius and sold items to the farmers who lived within one day's walk of the shop. If a customer walked 10 miles or 16 kilometers to get to the shop, then the customer might spend the night in the home of the business owner, be fed by that owner, and help with wood chopping chores and such. Each shop consisted of its owner and perhaps a live-in apprentice who becomes part of the family. Every product from apple pie to shoes and wool shirts is unique to that shop. Throughout the nation, a customer has thousands of varieties of, for example, apple pie to choose from. A business person is part of the community and not just hoping to become rich from them. Before a transaction was made between the proprietor and the customer, both persons would inquire about each and every member of the other's family. Prices are set by competition and supply and demand. So proprietors compete by selling the most products and services for the least amount of money that will allow them to continue operating and to pay their own living expenses. Consumers want nothing but to pay the lowest price. This was the background world for the reasoning of Adam Smith's Invisible Hand Economics, which he published in 1776. Many of today's proprietors continue to compete in this way. By the year 1850, 
Larger businesses serve customers in a state size region having a 100 mile or 160 kilometer radius. Some competitors secretly divide territories or agree to raise prices. The railroad companies were the first businesses needing to invent a large-scale organization able to administer an extensive enterprise spread across hundreds of miles or kilometers and directing thousands of employees. This is in contrast to the business enterprise since Mesopotamian times, which operated in a single building and village. By the year 1900, our largest businesses serves customers in a nation-sized region having a 1,000 mile or 1,600 kilometer radius. Business becomes nation-sized entities that single states cannot govern. The federal government creates antitrust laws to maintain competition. By 1950, each industry is dominated by a few large corporations. To obtain more income and profit, these simply raise prices on a frequent basis and cause inflation to become permanent, as we see in this chart. By the year 2000, the largest businesses serve customers in a planet-sized region having a 10,000 mile or 16,000 kilometer radius. These global corporations cannot be governed by one nation acting alone. Business dominates government in the U.S., Italy, Japan, and Israel. International mergers occur between those corporations that had already been dominating the industry of single nations. In 1999 alone, there were about 5,000 international mergers, which together involved 10% of global trade. Ever larger companies are made by the repeated sale and merger of other companies. For example, the Jack in the Box restaurant chain has 2,200 locations in the western U.S. and was sold to Ross and Perina, which makes animal food and also owns the Ever Ready Battery Company, the Van Camp Seafood Company and its Chicken of the Sea Tuna, and Continental Baking Company, which owns Wonder Bread and Hostess. Ralston Perino was sold to Nestle, which is a Swiss company, and then the British Petroleum, who had the 2014 oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, and then to Land O'Lakes, who sold it to Cargo, which controls 25% of all United States grain exports, 22% of the U.S. meat market, produces all of the eggs sold by McDonald's restaurants in the U.S., and is the only producer in the U.S. of Alberger processed salt, which is used in the fast food and prepared food industries. It is the largest poultry producer in Thailand, had revenues of $140 billion and earnings of $2 billion in 2013, and employs 140,000 persons in 66 countries. Today, about 500 global corporations dominate the planet's economy, and own over half of the world's production facilities. This means that a few thousand persons control half of the world's production assets. By 2016, the gross world product was $120 trillion. The gross sales of the 100 largest corporations was $24 trillion, but their value added accounts for just 4% of that gross world product. The world's 500 largest companies employ 65 million people and are based in 36 countries. This ever-increasing concentration of wealth serves no purpose for humanity, fueled in part as our business leaders pay non-living wages on a global scale. This unjustly delays the increase in well-being that would otherwise occur for all 7 billion of us. A global corporation does not belong to any one nation and is owned by a mixture of U.S., European, Japanese, Chinese, and Middle Eastern individuals. In the 1980s, foreign persons owned 5% of U.S. stock, but by 2016 it was 20%. Fifty years ago, each hotel and each restaurant was locally owned and operated by one family, 
and every food product was a unique local creation. Now every exit of the highway has the same collection of nationwide hotels and restaurants. 20 years ago there were 100 brands of ice cream, of beef jerky, and of every other item. Now every grocery store in the country contains the same brands and products, so a customer is lucky to find one dozen choices in the entire nation. The monopolized world is less interesting. If it is distributed today, then it has been monopolized. Monopolies have put an end to free market competition. When only a handful of companies account for half the sales within a particular industry, such as the television, cell phone, internet access, or airline industry, then that industry is said to be monopolized. We often hear of capitalism being the competition of the free market, but a few decades ago in the U.S., nearly every industry became monopolized and the free market essentially ended. A rare exception is the home construction industry, which cannot be monopolized today because it necessarily involves local workers and a handmade product. But we will soon have a 3D printing machine for this too. Those few companies of a monopolized industry do not compete in that they do not try to sell the most product and services for the least possible price, but instead mutually search for the highest possible price that the market will bear. This produces the largest possible profit percentages. They are happy to share the industry market because to risk further competition is to risk being the one out of three that would disappear. Supply and demand affects prices only when the supply is errantly controlled. Price wars do not occur. The highest possible price results in the highest profit percentage, but not the largest possible income. If one-tenth of this highest possible price is charged, there may be 20 times as many customers willing to buy. And this would double the total income, but at a lower profit percentage. Henry Ford said that every time he lowered the price of a Model T car by one dollar, an extra 1,000 customers would buy one. An industry has little competition, but there is some competition between industries. For example, the housing, food, entertainment, utility, automobile, and healthcare industries each want to have 50% of your monthly income. The U.S. had few roads before there were automobiles. In the early 1900s, car buyers demanded that the government build paved roads to get us out of the mud. Road construction and maintenance made the government larger. In a typical year, the U.S. government spends $50 billion on roads. And coincidentally, the annual profit of U.S. automakers has also been about $50 billion. Every brand new industry begins with numerous competitors and will have early competition that is soon followed by a series of successively larger mergers. The all-out attempt at monopoly creates a few large companies. For example, Merrill explains that 2,200 car models were made during the years 1895 to 1905 including 125 steam-powered and 125 electric-powered cars. Within a few decades, just a handful of companies remained, and those would no longer compete. When was the last time that you saw a price war among automakers, or an ad that brought attention to the shortcomings and flaws of another brand of car? The Bank of Italy, which is seen in the video, originated in San Francisco in 1904 to service the immigrant community. It bought the smaller company, Bank of America, but switched to their name. This chart shows mergers in the banking industry through the last few decades. Until 1980, laws required U.S. banks to be small institutions that took in and loaned out money to the neighborhood for the good of local residents. Local savings were used to finance home purchases and to develop local business. U.S. banks were dwarfed in size by the banks of Japan or Europe. 
During the 1980s, deregulation was meant to make the loan companies more profitable and allowed many to begin gambling local money on high-risk overseas endeavors rather than funding local home purchases at low profit. Through the decade, one-third of savings and loan companies went bankrupt, costing taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars. This was followed by the financial crisis and banking bailout of 2007 that cost taxpayers hundreds of billions of dollars. We can expect the next crisis to cost trillions. By 2015, the five largest banks held half of the $15 trillion U.S. market, which means that the U.S. banking industry is monopolized by a handful of banks said to be too big to fail. Barnett and Kavanaugh explained that banking became global by 1989 as one-fifth of home purchases in California were financed by banks in Japan without the customer knowing the source of the loan. That home loan could be bought and sold many times by banks in various nations. The home loan industry set off the financial crisis of 2007. In 2016, each of the 20 largest banks in the world had assets of 2 to $4 trillion for a combined total of $40 trillion. The gross world product was $120 trillion. Credit card companies have managed to receive 1% to 4% of every purchase made using the card. The merchant paid this fee until 2013 when contracts began allowing the merchant to charge the fee to the customers digital money will put an end to this. Until 1978, the interest rate on credit cards was limited to 12% in nearly every state. Then the Supreme Court ruled that a bank could charge the interest rate allowed in its home state. South Dakota and Delaware had no limit on interest rates, so credit card companies moved to those states. Many customers today are charged as much as 30% and the so-called payday loan companies receive 300 to 3,000 percent. You pay higher prices because every industry is monopolized in the U.S. Altogether, this costs each person a few thousand dollars per year in higher prices and enables billion dollar profits for each of those industries. Where 100 companies used to share an industry and its profits, now five or ten companies do and divide its increased profits among fewer owners and executives. The higher fees that you pay go straight into the pockets of a handful of owners. For example, persons in the U.S. purchase internet access from their choice of four providers and pay five times as much as do people in Britain where customers can choose from dozens of providers. Internet speeds are higher in many nations outside the U.S., and there is no difference between upload and download speeds. For example, in searching for the highest price that the market will bear, the price of a fruit drink was raised by five cents every five weeks through two years, taking the price from 49 cents to $1.49. This creates great profit, which is the income of the company owners. In Europe, customers choose from many airlines and find $50 fares for flights that cross the continent. In Southeast Asia, $50 flights cross oceans. In the U.S., there are now just three major airlines and three smaller airlines. This is what monopolization looks like in the U.S. airline industry, where $50 flights do not exist, and six airlines control 94% of the market. Teresa Setterholm says that airlines have realized that price wars are detrimental to their interest. When European and Asian airlines are allowed to operate in the U.S., then there will be $50 fares for flights that cross the continent. The purchase price of a flight changes every day, and this can mean that no two passengers pay the same price while taking the same flight. Your three-hour flight in the U.S. includes this food. The little pack is 0.42 ounce or 12 grams. 
but the big pack is one half ounce or 14 grams and contains this. We can imagine that an executive was outraged when someone suggested that the pack should contain a full ounce. A bus in Eastern Europe costs $10 to go from Tallinn, Estonia to Riga, Latvia. Each seat has wireless and a TV screen, and you can order a hot meal from an attendant. Nearly every industry has been monopolized, and this means higher prices for consumers and greater profit, which is the income of the owners. Larger companies try to squeeze out smaller companies in many ways. For example, a retail store might sign a contract with a manufacturer to sell brand A, but this contract requires that retail store to stop selling brands B and C. Such contracts are required by the manufacturers of anything from electronics to tractors. You know that each soda company prefers contracts that require a restaurant to sell only its one brand of soda. Here are some examples of monopolized markets. Procter & Gamble and Colgate Palmolive sell 70% of toothpaste, whose price can be $5 a tube. The visual capitalist explains that these five companies control the world's beer industry. These 14 companies control the world's auto industry. In other nations today, news events are still being covered by many news companies, each placing a microphone at the table. But that no longer happens in the U.S. These six companies control 90% of media. It turns out that corporate profit was more important than freedom of the press. One journalist recently said that there is freedom of the press today only if you own the press. And that each day, executives tell TV news anchors which stories to emphasize and in which way. A few decades ago, whenever a politician was interviewed on television, he or she had to debate a person who had an opposing view. Today we are mostly given the single view of one politician because politics has become the science of getting one's way. Media monopolization means that, for example, you might be in Lincoln, Nebraska listening to your favorite local FM radio station, but the DJs are sitting in a building in New York City and tell you nothing about the tornado in the area. Broadcast news on television stations in the U.S. insist every day on listing the murder and robbery that happened among the two million residents of the region. This frightening report sells lots of oatmeal commercials and increases media profit, but misleads citizens into thinking that everyone is a criminal. This reduces the faith in fellow citizens that is necessary to have democracy. TV news does not do this in other nations. A few companies control 91% of soft drinks, 64% of coffee, 80% of cereals, 72% of peanut butter, 76% of crackers, 81% of the chocolate market, 82% of the tortilla chip industry, 55% of ice cream, 76% of potato chips, a single company owns many brands. The Luxota company owns these eyewear brands and shop. It has 8,000 retail outlets and is now merging with the lens maker Essilor, which was created by the merger of Essel and Silor. Coffee retailers buy coffee from farmers in Africa and South America for $1 to $2 a pound then sell it in the U.S. for $10 per pound or $4 per cup at the restaurant. By 2011, four companies controlled 82% of U.S. beef packing, 85% of soybean processing, 63% of pork packing, and 53% of broiler chicken processing. These three companies control 81% of U.S. corn exports, and 65% of soybean exports. The U.S. government's economic census includes industry concentration data and shows that, for example, in the food processing industry, the eight largest companies account for 78% of sugar, 84% of dog and cat food, 67% of grain and oilseed milling, 68% of flour milling, 98% of wet corn milling, 
91% of soybean processing, and 92% of breakfast cereal. Meanwhile, track ripened fruit travels across continents and 20% arrives in a state of poor taste. Food typically travels hundreds of miles or kilometers before reaching your neighborhood. So political leaders should recommend that we plant home gardens. A typical grocery store sells 10,000 items, but the majority of products come from just 10 manufacturers. Numerous brands are made by one corporation. Unilever owns 400 brands, including these. Kraft Food Group has hundreds of brands, including these. By 2012, people of the U.S. bought half of their groceries from the four largest retailers, which are Kroger, Target, Safeway, and Walmart, which sells 29% of all groceries. Those of us who earn under $10 per hour, such as many Walmart employees, spend about 35% of our income on food. This means that Walmart is getting back 29% of 35%, or about 10% of the wages that it pays to those workers. Walmart sales increase when Walmart wages increase. To encourage Walmart to hire more employees, you might avoid the automated checkout line and leave the shopping cart in the lot. Those burdensome, frequent shopper cards are used to raise profits 2% by tracking your purchases and learning, for example, how many extra pennies you are willing to pay for the name brand items that are more profitable and what you chose not to buy that was sitting next to the item that you did buy. Such analysis predictably finds that people buy strawberries and whipped cream together but it also misleadingly suggests that people buy strawberries and tobacco together. Companies then place strawberries and whipped cream on opposite ends of the store in the hope that customers will grab extra items while having to walk across the store. These shopper cards are an example of the lengths to which corporations will go to get an extra 2% from you. But when asked why the CEO has paid so much money, the corporation responds, well, his salary is only 2% of gross sales. In the U.S. today, women hold 5% of CEO positions at S&P 500 companies. Binder paper in Europe looks like this. In the U.S., the margin was added in the hope that you would not use the leftmost 15% of the paper and instead buy 15% more paper. What do you do with the last sliver of soap? Press it onto the next bar of soap. This will reduce your soap purchases by 2%. Bananas were first cultivated 7,000 years ago in Southeast Asia and Papua New Guinea, and then spread along the Islamic equator about 1,000 years ago. Corton explains that when bananas began to be sold in the U.S. in the 1950s, fruit companies told customers not to refrigerate bananas. The fruit would then spoil faster, be thrown away, and, it was hoped, cause you to buy more. In reality, the interior fruit of bananas lasts longer when refrigerated, even though the cold darkens the outer skin. By the way, it works much better to open bananas by pinching the end that doesn't have the long stem. When people would plant grass lawns in the 1940s, they always included some dandelions to make the lawn more attractive. Weed killers were developed during research into biological weapons in World War II. When commercially available weed killer was developed for lawns, it was found that the chemical also killed dandelions. So the corporation redefined dandelions to be weeds. If you applied weed killer today, you'll have to reseed the dandelions. Such monopolization has occurred in every country. For example, Olam International was founded in Nigeria and controls 16% of global cocoa processing. Brazil's copper sucre controls 12% of world sugar and 12% of world ethanol. And Glencore is a British Swiss company that controls 60% of zinc, 50% of copper, and 9% of grains. How does a large monopolizing company squeeze extra profit? For example, 
Large meat processing companies pay farmers less money for a hog than occurred during the Great Depression, but sell the processed meat at an increasingly higher price. This also forces family-sized farms to disappear and to be replaced by large-scale farming factories, where one cow used to roam a square mile of land to obtain enough food. Now instead they are crammed along with their food and waste into small yards. Profit increases, but selling prices do not decrease, putting profit above free speech. An Alec bill makes it a criminal act to film animals being cruelly treated and slaughtered by the meat and poultry processing industries unless that industry gives permission to film. Corrupt legislators go along with this. Bill Moyers explains that Alec is the corporate-funded American Legislative Exchange Council. Alec drafts pro-business and conservative bills that legislators introduce into their state assemblies. About 200 of these bills become law each year, as Alec bills can dominate a state's legislation. This means that your state legislators might write fewer bills than does corporate-funded Alec. Recent Alec bills involve corporate taxation, stand-your-ground gun laws, privatizing education and prisons, and repealing labor rights. The globalization of the food industry makes the government less able to control its own food, health, and environmental standards. For example, food can be grown in another country using pesticides banned from use within the U.S., but that food can still be exported to the U.S. Horton explains that international trade agreements written by business and agreed to by governments can bring regulations down to the lowest common denominator among nations. These few companies make many brands and share the U.S. cigarette market. A few decades ago, a tobacco profit explosion occurred as tobacco companies paid small farmers in Africa and Brazil to switch their crop to tobacco and agreed to sell only to that company and at its price. Tobacco is bought for one or two dollars per pound but sold for several dollars per pack. The price is so high that in poor neighborhoods of inner cities, cigarettes can be purchased individually. Gordon explains that the tobacco industry raised cigarette prices through years because it found that it could. It had cost 62 cents per pack in 1980. Tobacco has been a 500 year long worldwide addiction. Since there is nothing else that has worldwide practice through centuries, I take this as proof that tobacco is addicting. Here is the famous moment in 1994 when tobacco CEOs testified before Congress that they believe tobacco is not addictive. It is not addictive. I heard virtually all of you touch on it, and just yes or no. Do you believe nicotine is not addictive? I believe nicotine is not addictive, yes. Mr. Johnston. Uh, Congressman, cigarettes and nicotine clearly do not meet the classic definitions of addiction. There is no right. intoxication. We'll, we'll take that as a no, and again, time is short. If you could just, I think each of you believe nicotine is not addictive. We just would like to have this for the record. I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I too believe that nicotine is not addictive. Right. Dr. Campbell, I assume that you're aware that your testimony, and you said uh, in your testimony that nicotine is not addictive, is contradicted by an overwhelming number of authorities and associations. For example, in 1988, the Surgeon General of the United States wrote an entire report on this topic. The Surgeon General, of course, is the chief health advisor to our government. They were speaking to their shareholders, whom they wanted to reassure, and did not care what the legislators or public thought. Many children live in a home where food costs more than one-third of family income. This defines the child poverty rate. It is a secret that through recent decades in the U.S., about one in five of our children live in a home whose income falls below the poverty line. 
the U.S. is performing poorly compared to other nations. Where are our efforts instead going? This percentage has been reduced in Europe as a result of a few decades of effort. The U.S. population in 2014 was 320 million persons. About 46 million are living in poverty, of which 20 million are white persons. Persons living in poverty are more likely to be white persons. There are twice as many white than black persons living in poverty. In the U.S., one in seven of us are earning minimum wage and one in seven of us are living in poverty. Those of us human beings who are poor are not stupid and lazy, and the rich are not geniuses and hard working. The same percentage of rich or minimum wage earners have high talent for engineering, surgery, or sculpture. We are born either poor, middle class, or wealthy. Very few of us become billionaires despite the constant mantra. Economic mobility is lower in the U.S. than it is in many nations. Poverty can be greatly reduced by doubling the minimum wage. Minimum wage means maximum profit for the person who owns the business, but it means an economically miserable life for the working person who is paying in this way for the easier life of the business owner. What is life like when trying to live on minimum wage in the U.S.? Such an income barely allows a person to pay rent and buy food. It means affording only an annual night out to a restaurant or movie theater and it means that consumer items priced over a hundred dollars are beyond easy reach. On payday, you might have twelve dollars left to last until the next payday. We do not have enough money to purchase hundred dollar per month car or health insurance, even if required by law, because we cannot afford even to purchase one dollar oranges or to eat at KFC. About one in five Americans have trouble affording fresh fruit today. Being poor means buying $1 but not $4 items at a fast food restaurant. Did you know that car insurance rates are typically doubled for those persons who could not afford to purchase car insurance in the previous year? Today's poor have a home and a phone, both of which are required for employment, but one in five or ten of us do not have a car, which is troublesome when smaller U.S. cities have no mass transportation. If you do have a car, you buy gas a few dollars at a time once every few days. Did you know that grocery store prices are always highest in poor neighborhoods that have the fewest cars and might have no public transportation? Those of us human beings who are poor are just as smart as everyone else. The existence of poor neighborhoods does not mean that one in seven of us is subhuman. It means that our economic society is ill and not yet fully human. Just 120 years ago, nobody's home had indoor plumbing or electricity, and the nation had only dirt roads. So we are making good progress in our civilization, but economic injustice has not yet been cleaned from our society. We all devote our lifetime's effort working our daily job and participating in the society and civilization that we expect to be mutually beneficial. Nobody should participate if it is not mutually beneficial. We cannot expect some people to give their lifetime's efforts and still go hungry to make a luxurious life for a few others. Do you want to reduce poverty, welfare, and high taxes? The first step is to double the minimum wage from $7 to $14 per hour. Earning $7 per hour means living on $14,000 per year, as was just described. Employers who pay minimum wage are shifting their labor costs to taxpayers. Does it make you mad when you pay extra taxes because some employers pay non-living wages that require taxpayers' assistance to their low-wage earners? In many states, employers pay waiters and waitresses half of minimum wage and profit from customers who instead pay wages directly to the waiters. Similarly, a utility company might charge a slightly higher rate because kind persons are donating money to help low-income families have heat and electricity. After adjusting for inflation, 
The price of rent plus utilities has doubled since 1950. The poorest 20% of us spend a third of our income on food and another third on rent, leaving a third left for everything else. Rent food and health care expenses have continually increased. How about our income? We are fundamentally nurtured and rewarded by the smiles we receive from our children or from helping other people. We naturally feel rewarded by contributing efforts to our society. That is in our nature. We feel a lesser reward when receiving a paycheck. Our wages have decreased through the last few decades in the U.S. as recorded in the annual economic report of the last 10 presidents. Here is a plot from the historical table B47 that shows the inflation adjusted weekly wage of non-farm private workers. We see that our wage peaked in 1972 and 3 at $340 and that we earn the same in 2010 as we did in 1980. Our earnings fell with little mention in the press and little debate by our politicians or presidential candidates. The Maringoffs point out that this means that we did not have a raise in 30 years, even while business profits grew greatly. This is one-sided. Lower wages make higher corporate profits, which become the income of the upper 0.1% of us. For example, in 2007, Goldman Sachs Investment Bank had 30,000 employees and paid $20 billion in all forms of compensation, but the 300 top executives got the lion's share, including $12 billion of it received as executive bonuses. Those 300 executives were paid more money than the U.S. government spent on the state children's health insurance program serving millions of children of low-paid workers, and more than the federal government spent that year on Hurricane Katrina reconstruction and relief. In 2008, Goldman Sachs tried to pay $14 million in taxes worldwide, which was an effective tax rate of 1%, by shifting its earnings to subsidiaries in low- or no-tax nations, such as the Cayman Islands. In the U.S. a few decades ago, CEO pay was 30 times greater than worker pay, but today it is 300 times greater. This has not occurred in other countries. The CEO of Disney once managed to pay himself two-thirds of the company's annual profit from all customers. To be CEO requires the belief that you deserve most of it for yourself. But the CEO requires these employment conditions for workers. These conditions did not exist 20 years ago. When applying for a job, we are given a 100 question psychological exam asking questions like, does it make you mad when criminals get away scot-free on a legal technicality? Does this mean that we now have only picture-perfect employees and that everyone believes in the constitutional right to due process? About 320,000 persons in the U.S. average $6 million in annual income and own 25% of the property and assets of all 320 million of us. They've hogged most of the nation's income and are mad when they have to pay most of the taxes. Taxes would be lower if wages were increased for low-income families who receive the earned income credit as an indirect wage from taxpayers. About 32,000 persons, or 16,000 families, have an annual income of $10 million and own 5% of the wealth. For example, Six members of the Walmart family have $150 billion in wealth, which is as much as the least wealthy, 160 million citizens of the U.S. This wealth is partially accomplished by paying non-living wages such that taxpayers have to pay a few billion dollars in food stamps and health care for Walmart employees. The U.S. economy is working very well for 16,000 families pretty well for 160,000 families, not so well for 145 million families, and terribly for 15 million families. 
the world has 7 billion people. In 2014, the world had 1,400 billionaires. 400 of them lived in the U.S. The next year, in 2015, 500 of 1,800 billionaires lived in the U.S., where the average wage has dropped 15% from its 1973 peak, and one in six or seven of us earned the non-living minimum wage. In the U.S., we are told that we will be billionaires if we are self-reliant and hard-working. What is really required is a monopoly. My friend Hester Amstel explains that in Europe, people instead expect to share a comfortable lifetime. In Europe, the wealthiest 1% did not manage to hog all of the income for themselves. The economists Sayers and Piketty show that, through the last few decades, those of us in the U.S. who are very wealthy have managed to hog more of the income for ourselves, as seen in the right-hand side of this plot. There is no such thing as trickle-down economy. This upper income grab occurred in the U.S. because of wealth-friendly legislation and lowered tax rates. Who wants to have lower taxes for the most wealthy of us in the U.S.? Those 500 billionaires and their political and media advocates. Ever since Reagan's administration, each time government has reduced taxes for the wealthy, the nation instead borrowed more money to replace the lost tax revenue and this increased the national debt. Sayez explains that upper wealth increases when upper tax rates decrease. The red curve shows the top marginal tax rate. As the red tax rate goes down, the upper income share goes up. This occurred in the 1920s and since the 1980s. This wealth and income grab has occurred in the dark and in silence. In response, we'll now require that product labels, ads, and websites state worker and executive pay along with profit percentages and such, as seen here. To combat monopolies, shareholder and market share information, along with the name of the CEO and the most parent company, and the number of businesses and brand names under that parent will be stated. In 2015, the richest 62 persons in the world had 1.8 trillion in wealth, which is as much as the poorest half or 3.5 billion of us. Larry Elliott states that those 62 persons could fit in one bus. Wealth concentration is increasing. In 2010, it was 388 rather than 62 persons. The priority of our civilization can be the health, happiness, and education of our children, or the priority can be to turn a few hundred millionaires into billionaires before they die, just like the rest of us. One of our billionaires can shout, I have as much wealth as the poorest one billion persons, but extreme wealth is nothing but proof of your ability to take money from other people. In New York City in 2015, the securities industry paid $25 billion in bonuses to 17,000 persons, which is an average of 150000 per person. These bonuses were great enough to raise the pay to $15 per hour for all 2.6 million fast food workers in the U.S. In 2015, the top 10% earn an annual income of at least $140,000 per year. They have 80 to 95 percent of stocks, bonds, trust funds, and business equity, and almost 80 percent of non-home real estate. G. William Donoff explains that financial wealth is what counts as far as the control of income-producing assets. The richest persons and companies junk old money every day between stocks, bonds, and currency and such as they continually try to outguess each other's reaction to daily events. They can think alike enough for the daily news to state that the Dow Jones has changed today in response to a specific event. Currency speculation is a humongous daily activity. In 2015, the gross world product was $80 trillion per year, or $0.2 trillion per day. But currency trading amounts to $5 trillion per day. 
of which less than 1% involves the sale of actual goods and services. Alexandro explains that, on a daily basis, the financial institutions of the city of London make speculative currency trade worth nearly as much as the entire nation's GDP for a whole year. Out of this daily currency trade, the $2 trillion per day spot market is controlled by fewer than 100 individuals working for a dozen large banks. With such concentration of business, illegal market manipulation can easily occur. In the Forex scandal of 2013-14, some 15 banks, including Citibank, HSBC, JP Morgan, Royal Bank of Scotland, and UBS AG of Switzerland, paid $5.7 billion in fines for selling or buying for themselves just before fulfilling large orders. Those 400 banks fired 40 employees due to this scandal. The daily profits and loss are huge. For example, a London bank finds out that a Russian bank is buying British pounds, so London buys one billion worth and sells it a few hours later for a $200,000 profit, while another company might lose $200,000. Annual profits or losses for one bank can be $100 million. Due to the volume of this daily speculation, a single nation can no longer control the value of its own currency. All of this will end when a global currency is created, but for that to occur, nations must learn that the stability of the global economic system is of greater importance than the mere prestige of a nation having its own currency. The retirement accounts of the top 100 CEOs are worth a combined $5 billion, which is more than the entire retirement savings of over 115 million Americans. The nation's 500 billionaires and their political and media advocates would like to end the U.S. government's social security system, saying that we should all just speculate on stocks, bonds, and currencies and such. But for most of us, our weekly income is spent entirely on the daily needs of food and rent and such. Ending the public social security system would leave our elders in poverty after they are too old to work. Such poverty occurred until the social security system was created in 1935. A measure of income or wealth inequality is given by the Gini Index, which goes from zero to one. The value zero means that one person has all the wealth, and the value one means that every person has equal wealth. The increasing income inequality since the 1972 peak in U.S. wages is shown by this plot of the Gini Index. In this international comparison, we see that income inequality is falling in Mexico, but growing in Brazil. In Mexico, every company is partially owned by its employees, as law requires 10% of pre-tax earnings to be distributed among employees. Employees and management share equally in policies involving health, safety, training, productivity, seniority and work rules. Our businesses also became more profitable through automation and increasing productivity since the 1970s, but family income did not grow with business profits. To increase family income, both parents began working in the 1970s, though this meant that less time could be spent with children. The economic system consists of wage earners who are paid to work in one company and who purchase goods and services, mostly from other companies. The total income of all businesses can be no more than the total of all wages paid to employees. The middle class is both wage earner and consumer. The size of the economy depends on the number of workers and the volume of purchases. Today the size of the middle class is 270 million people in the U.S., but 350 million persons in India. When wages decrease, then factory sales and production both decrease. In response, factories lay off workers, and in turn, this further decreases purchases and factory production causing a downward spiraling economy. 
During the Great Depression of the 1930s, we learned the hard way to have unemployment insurance so that people have money to continue purchasing goods. In this way, unemployment insurance is also factory production insurance, and it enables unemployed people to buy food and pay rent, too. Some legislators have actually complained about the cost of unemployment payments and say that U.S. companies could enjoy $1 per hour wages if the minimum wage were eliminated. $1 per hour wages would mean great profit for a few months, but U.S. workers would not have enough money to buy anything. All factories would close and the economy would collapse. Company sales and profits increase when wages increase. One businessman doesn't care too much if sales are decreased at other companies, so he pays wages as low as possible. As the average wage has been cut by 15% since 1972, wage-earning customers have had less money to buy goods and services. Wage-cutting business owners have strangled their own sales and profit and helped to cause recession. Business profits grew as tax rates were decreased, starting with Reagan in the 1980s. As the U.S. reduced taxes for the wealthiest and for corporations, it began borrowing money. In this plot, we see that the national debt grew greatly with Reagan and then Bush, decreased with the Democrat Clinton, grew with George W. Bush and his trillion dollar war in Iraq, and continued growing with Obama. U.S. military spending has doubled from 2000 to 2015 as it went from 300 to 600 billion dollars per year. Just after World War II, the upper income tax rate was 90 percent, the corporate tax rate was 50 percent, and business was booming in the U.S. The capital gains tax occurs on profit from stocks, bonds, precious metals, and property. At its 1952 peak, the U.S. government obtained one-third of its revenue from corporate taxes, but this became 11% in 2015. Though the corporate tax rate is 33%, in practice, many corporations pay a tax rate of 10 to 20% because of loopholes. These nations have money in the bank. but these nations are in debt. The national debt of the U.S. dwarfs that of all other nations. It is suicidal policy for the U.S. to decrease taxes on the wealthy, borrow money instead, and then spend 6% of its income on interest due to debt. About half of this debt is owed mostly to China, Japan, Belgium, the Caribbean banks, and the Middle East, who have been funding the U.S. government including its military. The nation's 500 billionaires and their political and media supporters call to reduce tax rates on business and the wealthy. When presidents and legislators do this, then they also borrow money from the world to make up for the reduced taxes, and this increases the national debt. During the years 2008 through 2012, in a study by CTJ, these companies paid no taxes. These companies paid no taxes in at least one of those years. The 288 companies in that study earned $2.3 trillion in pre-tax profits, paid an average tax rate of 19%, and were exempted from paying a $400 billion portion of their taxes due to government subsidies. Wells Fargo received $21 billion in subsidies. The amount shown here are given in millions of dollars. Goldman Sachs received $4,000 million or $4 billion during this time period. To make up for the $400 billion worth of avoided taxes, the U.S. government must instead pay less money on children's well-being or borrow more money while growing the military. Your local doctor works hard to maintain your health and charges about $100 for your visit. 
but the average cost of a three-day hospital stay is around $30,000. The huge expense of our health care system is not in local doctors, but in hospitals and surgery. In the last few years, hospitals have been buying independent providers to forge regional monopolies. In 60% of regions, only one or two hospital entities exist, so they increase prices. They might also force health care plans, including those run by large insurance companies and large employers, to sign contracts in which they promise not to steer patients to lower cost hospitals. Some cities, counties, or regions have a single hospital entity. For example, in Kitsap County, Washington, heavy cardiologists, oncologists, pulmonologists, urologists, and vascular and orthopedic surgeon are employed or under contract with CHI Franciscan Health. Kaiser Health News reports that chain hospitals use their market power to charge 25% more and reduce costs, but they keep the savings for their own profit rather than reducing prices. Pharmaceutical companies promote myths to explain why they charge higher prices in the U.S. than they charge in other countries, but the CEOs and owners simply want half of your monthly income. One way to raise the retail price of a drug is to purchase competing manufacturers and then raise prices by 600% or even more. For example, the drug maker Horizon manufactures Duxis, which inhibits stomach acid production. After Horizon bought its competitor, customers now pay $1,500 per month, though the drug is made for $40. Israel-based Teva Pharmaceuticals buys companies who manufacture competing generics. Through acquisitions, Millen became the second largest generic and specialty pharmaceutical company in the world. It bought India-based Matrix Laboratories, bought a division of the U.S. company Abbott Laboratories, tried to buy the Irish pharmaceutical firm Perigo, and also tried to buy Milan, which operates from the United Kingdom, though it is registered in the Netherlands so that it can pay lower taxes. Milan next bought the Swedish company Mita, who recently bought the Italian company Rotafarm. Milan thus gained market share in China, Southeast Asia, Russia, the Middle East, Mexico, Brazil, and Africa. Mita says that it does not invent drugs. Instead, new products are secured through acquisitions. For health care, U.S. citizens pay five to ten times as much as the people of other nations and twice as much as Europeans who are living healthier, longer lives. The U.S. life expectancy ranks 43rd out of the 220 nations of the world in 2015. A few decades ago, U.S. citizens were spending 2% of their income on health care. In 2015, health care per person was $9,500, as the health industry managed to grab 18% of the GDP and already dreamed of getting 50 or 100%. But hospital stays that cost $100,000 in the U.S. might cost $5,000 in Asia. Because of these costs, about 1% of the U.S. population accounts for 25% of all the nation's health care expenditures. Staying a few days in a hospital can cost you a few years' wages. The U.S. health care system is the best that a person can buy with a lifetime's wages. We have already learned that our health care system is no place for profit-seeking. Neither are police and firefighting services. Two corporations control 70% of health insurance market in each state and charge what the market will bear. In fact, about 20,000 of us die every year because we cannot afford to go to the doctor. This is about 1% of the 2 million persons who die every year in the U.S. The healthcare industry is taking money from education and other services. Since 1993 in the U.S., state Medicaid programs have been confiscating the homes of deceased persons to recover money paid by Medicaid to nursing homes. Homes haven't been confiscated since medieval times. Nursing home prices have doubled every 15 years, while the real wages of nurses changed little. To obtain health care, 
the people of the U.S. should travel to another country. There, they will pay much less for the same procedure using the same technique by equally talented doctors. Nothing matters more to us than the well-being of our newborn children. We, the human beings of the world, state that the first priority of our efforts is to ensure that our babies do not die. We gauge the success of our leaders and of our civilization first of all by our infant mortality rate. We want to see second by second figures, not for stock prices but for our infant mortality rate, which states the number of children per thousand births who die before reaching their first birthday. Out of 220 nations in the world, the U.S. is number 58. What could possibly matter more to us than the lives of our infants? The Marine Goffs explain that the infant mortality rate is a sensitive measure of our society's sanitary and health conditions and of our ability to protect the most vulnerable of us. This rate has been found to be sensitive even to small changes in technology and public policy so it is also a measure of the effectiveness of those policies and in applying our base of technical health knowledge. A poor rate has been seen to be easily improved. The United States International Ranking in Infant Mortality was 12th best in the world in 1960 and then fell to 23rd in 1990, 30th in 2005, and 56th in 2016. The U.S. is performing poorly in education and infant mortality rates because of its wealth and income inequality. The poor of the nation have rates that are among the worst in the world. We can't let unelected business leaders run the education or health care aspects of our civilization because first, that goes against democracy, and second, Free market competition ended a few decades ago as every industry became monopolized. We have all seen images of manufacturing plants closing throughout the U.S. while business was booming elsewhere. First in Japan, as seen here, and then in Korea, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Brazil, and the Middle East. Here is a 2001 video of construction in Dubai that just goes on and on. No U.S. city is building like this. U.S. and European corporations moved their factories where wages were one dollar per day. But notice that this did not mean, for example, that the price of shoes was reduced to pennies. The lower cost of labor instead meant increased profit for the people who own the corporation. The person in Asia who is paid one dollar per day to make shoes cannot afford to buy the shoes that are instead transported to the US, Europe and Japan where they can be sold for one hundred dollars. That is globalization. Barnett and Kavanaugh explained that to advertise products in 1992 Nike paid the basketball star Michael Jordan $20 million, which was more money than all the workers were paid to make them in Indonesia. Nike sells half of all sports footwear bought in the U.S., but Nike does not make shoes. It buys them from companies that made them in Asia and then sells them in the U.S., Europe, and Japan. In 2015, its gross margin was about 50% on an annual sales of $30 billion and it paid $0.7 billion in taxes worldwide for a tax rate of about 22% on its net income of $3 billion. In the last decade, corporations have also been moving engineering and science out of the U.S. Your medical x-rays and such might be evaluated by a doctor in Asia. Today, 90% of the world's engineers are in India and China. And today, Dubai has the tallest building in the world the Burj Khalifa, and the futuristic system.
Throughout the last decade, China has been doing much of the world's manufacturing, but is receiving a profit of only about 10% of the sales. Most of the profit is going to the U.S., European, and Japanese companies who ordered the manufacturing from China and then transported the products to those countries where the products could be sold for the greatest profit. Workers in Chinese factories today mirror many miseries that workers had in the U.S. textile industry during the 1880s, as described by Reese. The largest migration ever has been the 100 million persons who left the farming villages of China to work in factories in the cities. In comparison, it took 100 years for 30 million Europeans to migrate to the U.S. As in today's U.S., every small town in China has been drained of people aged 18 to 40. In her book, Factory Girls, Leslie T. Chang describes life for workers in the factories of China. She explains that people leave the village by taking their first ever bus ride which might make them car sick just like your first ride may have done for you. As a girl leaves the village, she will be finding her way alone in the big city and learn that she can trust only herself. Parental advice applies only to the world of the village, where everyone helps everyone else, not the big city. New there arrived migrants must get a cell phone because it is crucial to obtain a job and talk with friends. One girl, Min, arrived when she was 16, slept her first night under an overpass, and ran for her life when she interviewed at a supposed hair salon. To run, she had to leave behind her suitcase, ID, and possessions. She hid in a chicken coop until the next day, and then she begged for money in the street. She found someone's ID card on the ground and went to work in a factory as she pretended to be that person. Workers must be 18 years old to work, but a small shop that employs just a few dozen persons might blatantly break the law and hire 16-year-olds. There are so many factories in China that barkers stand at the factory entrance enticing passers-by to work there because it is wonderful. Factories hire every day at 1.30 p.m. and openly discriminate by gender, height, and home province which is like saying, no Irish or New Yorkers and few men need apply. Factories make everything that you buy, including clothing, toys, electronics, cell phones, computers, or maybe just keyboards. Factories are huge. Having as many as 70,000 employees who eat in the factory's cafeteria and sleep in the factory's dorms. Workers sleep 10 or 12 per room in dorm rooms that have no privacy and use a shared shower and bathroom that is down the hall. Workers dry their laundry by hanging it around their bed. The dorms are unheated and cold in the winter. Mill breaks last one hour and there are separate cafeterias for workers, supervisors, and line leaders. Only the children of the leaders can go to the factory's daycare and school. The factory also has its own hospital, fire department, power plant, shops, and movie theaters. Except for Saturday afternoons, city streets are vacant as everyone is working, eating, and sleeping in the factories. The U.S. sometimes brags of creating 100,000 jobs in a month. But that is just two factories in China. So many factory jobs are available in China that a person could switch jobs every day. To ensure that workers stay for at least six months, their first two months pay is withheld for six months. After that, the worker can request to receive that money. When a new worker tells the boss that he or she wants to quit, the boss decides whether or not and in which future month the worker will be allowed to quit. The new worker can leave but forfeits those first two months pay in what is said to be crazy leaving. Workers say that they eat bitterness and endure and when they quit the factory then they feel free. After working for a few years they may have sent enough money back home for their parents to buy a toilet or a television 
or even a new home. The shoe factories of Dongguan make one third of the world's shoes, including name brands. Some 60 to 80 percent of the workers are women. A shoe is assembled in 10 hours by a series of 200 workers, each doing a five second task about 5,000 times per day. Workers are paid the legal minimum wage of $2.50 per day, which was in 2008. Workers are fined one hour's pay for talking or being late. They must work 60 hours per week and have Sunday off. If they miss a day of work, then they are fined one week's pay. Ten-minute bathroom breaks are allowed once every few hours and require a sign-up sheet. Workers are on their own when sick or hurt. There are deadly fires and factory machines that sometimes chop fingers. Again, the girl Min told her boss that, Your factory is not worth wasting my entire youth here. The same working conditions occur in Chinese-owned factories outside of China. The government of China has little incentive to protect workers but wants to keep factory owners happy and actively promotes 18-year-olds to leave the village to go work in the factories. The 18-year-old villager imagines that factory work will be a fun-filled social life. In 2005, China allowed Airbus to begin building airplanes in China as long as that company helped to teach Chinese engineers to design the airplanes. The executives at Airbus explained that it would be creating its own competitor, but was happy to have some years of lowered labor costs and increased profits before that competition took off. All that mattered was having a few years of great profit. In June 2017, China flew its first home-designed airplane. China is no longer providing just the labor. Through the last few decades, the U.S. has been switching from manufacturing to services such as retail and health care. As manufacturing moved overseas, U.S. citizens exchanged their $25 per hour manufacturing jobs for $9 per hour service sector jobs. Within a few years, robots will do these jobs. Remember that decreased wages are followed by decreased purchases by workers and in turn, this causes decreased manufacturing. In every large corporation, a profit of billions is distributed among a few hundred persons. Where 100 companies used to share an industry and its profits, now 5 or 10 companies do. And this concentrates wealth into the pockets of the nation's 500 billionaires and the upper 0.01% or 16,000 families. Industry monopolization enables the size of these profits. Every industry is monopolized in the U.S., and this costs each person a few thousand dollars per year in higher prices. The higher prices that you pay go straight into the pockets of very few persons. Monopolization is the elimination of competition so that a large company's buying costs can be forced down through sheer volume and its retail selling prices can be set not by competition in supply and demand, but to be as high as the market will bear. The few companies that control an industry do not compete to sell the greatest amount of goods and services for the least price. Instead, they prefer to remain being one of the few companies controlling their industry market. Every year there are price-fixing scandals. As the nation industrializes, employers have the upper hand and cause some persons to live under the unjust situation of a precarious existence. In the U.S., the situation started small in 1820, but grew for some decades until the national labor strikes of the 1880s and 90s. Inequality within the U.S. reached its first peak during the 1920s and again today where the most wealthy 1% of us own 40% of all assets. When a business reduces costs by laying off workers or reducing their pay, 
A business executive who thought of it receives a portion of the savings as a bonus. Capitalism works great for the 0.01% of us who are greedy enough to be capitalists and behave as if it is everybody for themselves. But extreme wealth is nothing but proof of your ability, or that of your recent ancestors, to overcharge other people. We each contribute our life's efforts to our industrial ways because we believe that it holds great promise for a better life for all of us in a mutually beneficial manner. Most of us just want to earn enough money to sustain a comfortable quality of life for our family. Few of us have an interest in accumulating an industrial empire or having as much money as millions of other persons. As the promise of our civilization increases, it does not have to mean an increase in injustice. We will know that we have finished building our civilization when such injustice no longer occurs. If wage earner customers decided to return to the self-sufficient life of family farmers who buy no products, then business owners would soon have to also. The total income of all businesses can be no more than the total of all wages paid to employees. Business owners could instead pay zero wages if they could convince taxpayers to pay the entire income of workers. When direct wages from employers are too little, then we have indirect wages that are redistributions of taxes collected from all citizens, including employers. In another extreme choice, we could be paid no wages at all and instead be stockholders in employee-owned companies that have no labor costs. Nothing about today's world of big business and big government makes any sense until we look at the social and economic changes in our way of life as we switch from being farmers to being wage-earning factory workers who not only make goods but purchase them too. We have seen that many U.S. government laws and regulations were created in response to improper actions of many business persons who loudly proclaim today that there should be no laws or regulations of business. They say this because they hope to have no laws limiting their greed and cruelness. If we were to remove all government regulation, as is the dream of many of today's 500 billionaires and their political and media advocates, then we would again work 16 hours per day starting at age 10, be paid too little for food and rent, be sold contaminated meat and milk, and have no choice but to abandon 1% of our babies, as described by Reese. If all regulations were removed, I am certain that business owners would strive to take as much as possible, as fast as possible, before the system were unraveled by their very actions. As was recently demonstrated in the saving and loan fiasco, the California power outage scam by Enron, and by the 2007 upheaval in our newly grown financial corporations labeled too large to fail or compete. The unbridled greed of many business persons would unravel the economic system within a few months, causing a global depression, but in response, we might set up a system in which industry competition is permanent, companies are numerous and competing, and living wages are paid. We have already learned that we cannot allow our global economic well-being to be directed by a small number of business persons. We want to have 100, not 5, companies competing in each industry. Outside the U.S., Retail stores are still tiny family businesses rather than the supermarkets that are a tourist attraction for foreign visitors. The Obama administration, the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Competition, and the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department readily allowed mergers as long as five companies would still exist in the industry and it was not brazenly apparent that the merger would increase prices. The lawyers who represent companies trying to get their merger approved by these governmental agencies are the same lawyers who later run those government agencies. They frequent the so-called revolving door between industry and the government agency which is supposed to regulate that industry. Self-employed persons who employ a few other persons often work night and day rarely get a vacation, 
and struggle to get enough sales to cover payroll, but are happy to not have a boss and are lucky to earn a profit, which is their own wage, that compares to the income of the average citizen. Half of U.S. workers are employed by so-called small businesses having less than 250 employees, which includes fast food restaurants and such. Retail stores, car dealerships, hotels, and fast food restaurants are often franchise operations. The franchise headquarters manufactures products and sells them to the franchise operators who then retail them to individual customers. One company, the franchise headquarters, will sell its know-how, brand name, and products to many independently owned smaller companies who are franchise operators and retail stores. Each operator runs their own business but the headquarters is often the sole provider of the products sold by the operators who can be held hostage to the prices and whims of the headquarters. The headquarters makes its money by selling items to the operator and it might receive a portion of the gross sales of every operator. The headquarters does not retail directly to the consumer unless it opens a few retail stores of its own. Some manufacturers are legally forbidden to market directly to consumers. That step is left only to franchise retailers. Some manufacturers are also legally required to buy back the inventory of an operator who goes out of business. When a retailer of cars, boats, tractors, or electronics and such decides to begin selling an additional brand, that manufacturer might require the retailer to stop selling competing brands. In 1985, computer manufacturers would not be supplied with any Microsoft product unless they agreed to install a Windows operating system in at least 90% of the computers that they ship. And within a few years, 90% of consumers owned a computer that automatically came with Windows whether you wanted it or not. Before Microsoft Windows, nobody in history had ever purchased something against their own will. It was like buying a stereo and also being charged for an unwanted toaster. Some persons received their new computer and then removed Windows because it occupied half the computer's memory space. Still today, the open source Linux operating system is the only sensible thing for the world. The startup fees for a fast food franchise restaurant today is often one or two million dollars. As you start construction of your restaurant, which is identical to hundreds of others, the headquarters will charge you fifty thousand dollars for its blueprints. The headquarters charges every operator for blueprints. You'll pay about 10% of your gross sales to the headquarters, and you must purchase all of your food and materials from the headquarters at whatever price they decide to charge. There is a chance that you'll get your startup money back within a few years. The headquarters makes all of its money by selling things to you. It doesn't make its money directly from your customers. As it is said, the McDonald's Corporation does not sell hamburgers to the public. It sells them to the franchise operators. The headquarters might set the retail prices that the operator charges customers who walk in the door. Sometimes, the headquarters will announce a nationwide sale having a reduced retail price at the same time that it raises the price that the operators pay the headquarters. This move increases profit for the headquarters by squeezing the operators. Some operators can choose not to participate in that nationwide sell. The franchise headquarters will train you to operate your business according to their ways. From the beginning, the headquarters wants to dictate the size and contents of your retail store. For example, the headquarters might demand that you construct a larger building with a larger display room so that both of you will get more money. If you will be selling high dollar items, like boats and such, then you will have to provide a guarantee that you can pay for those items. For example, by allowing the headquarters to hold the deed to your home. As your customers purchase these high dollar items from you through a bank loan, 
you will bear responsibility in the case that that customer fails to make payments to the bank. The bank will hold some of your money for this purpose so that you, not the bank, take the risk. You can also buy insurance to cover that situation. When a tractor is sold for $100,000, the dealer gets about $3,000 and the manufacturer keeps the rest. The mechanics of car, boat, and tractor dealers perform warranty work for the franchise headquarters, who pays the dealer a fee that depends on the rating that it has given that dealer. The franchise operator inflates warning claims sent back to the manufacturer because the manufacturer expects that and typically pays just a portion of the requested amount. The headquarters handles national advertising and will send you a monthly bill for your share of the total fee because some of your own income might result from those ads. The headquarters will also pay a portion of your local advertising expense. The headquarters might send you a poster to hang in the lobby and bill you $200 for it and bill the other thousands of franchise operators for their copy of this poster. The headquarters will ship anything they can think of to you and bill you for it because they make their money from you. You are the captive customer of the headquarters. If you try to refuse to pay for something that you don't want, they will threaten to terminate your franchise. If the headquarters decides to fund a NASCAR racing car, which costs $10 million, then they will simply bill $5,000 to each of their 2,000 franchise operators. Franchise operators often complain that the headquarters acts as a tyrant, telling you to do this or your contract will be terminated. Ford car dealers were already complaining of the headquarters back in the 1920s. When operators end the franchise contract, they might say that life is now easier without the tyrant, but it is now more work to get customers into the building since they no longer sell that nationally known name brand. Worldwide, some 1.3 million people die in road crashes every year and 20 to 50 million are injured or disabled. In 1965, Ralph Nader encouraged the auto industry to consider building cars that were more safe. Since the 1970 peak, 30 to 50,000 people have died each year in the U.S. Auto manufacturers say that deaths and car crashes are acts of God. But NASCAR drivers travel at triple the highway speed, tumble and roll after collisions, and walk away from crashes. Why aren't personal cars as safe as race cars? I would rather my family member wear a six-point harness than be killed in a car wreck. In the last 25 years, one million persons died in car wrecks in the U.S., but there were only 520 fatal crashes in U.S. auto racing. Auto manufacturers have given us one century of avoidable death. The industry could design the automobile to be as safe as race cars. For starters, the passenger compartment would have maximum strength if it were spherically shaped. Historically, car manufacturers have shown much more concern in reducing unit costs by pennies than in eliminating deaths. They chose to save pennies per car by removing window halves and outside locks on rear doors and they prefer to risk a $300 million recall by saving $4 per car today. Even if it means the death and injury of customers, only savings and lawsuits go into the calculation, not lives. U.S. car makers typically get $1,000 profit from small cars, but $5,000 from large trucks, so they strive mostly to sell large vehicles and are racing us toward bus-sized cars. Don't choose a vehicle that gets less than 50 miles per gallon. Even better, choose an electric vehicle whose battery is charged by a windmill. When a car driver hits a telephone pole and survives, the driver must pay the phone company to replace the pole. Utility companies have not been required to move poles away from roads because that would cost money. For many years, 
China allowed car manufacturers to reduce costs by emitting the smog control device. Smog in their cities is as bad as it was in Los Angeles in 1963 before the Clean Air Act began laws requiring manufacturers to reduce pollution from factories and cars. In the U.S. each year, car companies sell 50 million new and used cars for $1 trillion, which is three times the total of new home sales. Marketing tries to convince you to pay double for a name brand so that that name brand's executives and major shareholders will get billions of dollars. Marketing wants you to refer to Pepsi as real soda, but in real life, the brand of soda that you drink for two weeks straight will become the one that you think tastes normal. Try it. There is no reason to pay double for a name brand. Some companies spend one quarter of their income on advertising. About 200 companies account for half of all advertising. Facebook and Google make $100 billion per year on advertising. When I hear an advertisement, it makes me try to chew my own head off to end the unwanted intrusion of nonsense. My doctor told me that I have fabricitis and aerobia, which is a phobia of the impossible. If it were up to me, I'd outlaw the advertising use of adverbs, adjectives, dramatic reenactments, displays of mood, music, jingles, children, testimonials, and the phrase order in the next 10 minutes. All that would remain is for an ad to make a statement like, Joe's Diner sells food from 2 to 4 p.m. Monday to Thursday. Today, companies try to get you to advertise for them by clicking the like button or sharing a link to their product. Today's ads follow us around the internet. While you use the internet, companies track and analyze, and often sell, records of every website that you visit. This information is used by companies in every possible way. Companies dream that soon, every emotion that you feel, and every word that you speak while clicking can be monitored by software that reads facial expressions from your camera and conversations from your microphone. They hope to read your mind, determine your interests, personality, and political views, and sell you more of what you should want to buy. This makes maximum profit but minimum privacy, and it also fuels dictators. Now companies want to listen to your conversation and send ads that match your current topic. Even the spread of flu is indicated by the use of the word flu in web searches and in Twitter and email messages and such. Internet search engines are advertising engines that receive money from your browsing and so have turned in the shopping lists more than information sources. For example, a search for boat begins with a list of websites that sell boats. Search engines show you more of those sorts of websites that their records show you have already visited because your clicking is then more likely to earn income for the search engine company. For example, your web searches show whether you are liberal or conservative, and the search engine will return first those websites selling something that matches your interest. Tracking your internet usage is identical to having a person walk behind you all day while recording everything that you buy, do, or say, and noticing which things you didn't buy that are right next to those that you did buy. No tracking occurs in internet systems that are open source and public domain. Companies cannot profit from your picture unless you sign a contract, but companies profit from recording and selling your browsing history. This is a form of stalking, which is illegal. I'd outlaw this an unpaid use of your external image or digital records of your internal, physiological, emotional, and medical state. Your shopping and browsing history represents your internal state. By the way, when internet usage is analyzed to detect criminals, it generates 14 billion false positives per day. Market researchers hire a group of people to use as test subjects. The marketers try out various products, advertisements, and sales tactics on that group of people whose heartbeat rates and interest levels are monitored by the second. Additional researchers sit on the other side of the one-way mirror and try to figure out the most appealing name and appearance of 
For example, oatmeal. The marketers sell a mood more than a product and search for statements and visuals that will push your emotional buttons and get you to buy or to vote. Politicians and political statements are marketed just like oatmeal. Ever since Nixon, statements that seemed to be made off the cuff had already been test marketed with a group of people. Marketers tell politicians to be committed and uncompromising, though that is contrary to democracy, which functions as a blending of views that partially satisfies everyone. Rather than explaining to constituents that democracy requires compromise, politicians pretend to be committed and uncompromising, even refusing to use the word compromise in public interviews. The U.S. government is a balance of power among executive, legislative, and judicial branches, which consists of about 500 persons. We learned the hard way in previous centuries that we cannot have a single leader dictate policy and action for all of us. Today, no legislation or policy happens unless a sufficient number of those 500 persons agree to it. Much of daily politicking, including the barrage of issue ads, occurs as small groups try to convince enough people to agree to their wishes. In politics, perception is a powerful reality. Many of today's sordo news channels promote a single view of priorities for the nation. Politics has become the science of getting one's way. One market researcher tested various euphemisms for the phrase estate tax, which wealthy persons were hoping to end. The researcher found that people did not care about estate taxes, but reacted strongly to the phrase death tax, and would then vote to end the tax. This same researcher found that people reacted less strongly to the phrase climate change than they did to the phrase global warming. Conservative politicians then switched to that less emotional phrase. In response, the rest of us will now refer to global warming as global death. For example, if global warming led to the extinction of 500 species of mammals, would that have any effect on the other species? Well, there are only 5,000 species of mammals on the planet, so 500 would be 10% of all species. Should we gamble on this to save pennies in business costs? The many factors of long-term climate are described in another video of this series. In summary, we ask, what would be the temperature of the Earth if it had no ocean or atmosphere and was just as far from the sun as it is now? Its temperature would be just like the moon, which has no ocean or atmosphere and is just as far from the sun. The moon's surface temperature swings through 500 degrees Fahrenheit or 300 degrees centigrade from day to night. The Earth's ocean and atmosphere hold heat and reduce the day to night temperature swing to just 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 degrees centigrade. The equations of physics show that if the Earth had its ocean and an atmosphere of just nitrogen and oxygen but no water vapor or greenhouse gases, then the surface temperature of the Earth would be 20 degrees cooler than it is. The surface temperature depends sensitively on the greenhouse contents of the atmosphere. The atmosphere is 30 miles or 50 kilometers tall and its temperature is minus 450 Fahrenheit or minus 270 centigrade at the top and 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 30 degrees centigrade at the bottom where we live. Even on a hot summer day the temperature of the atmosphere drops to minus 40 degrees just 6 miles which is 10,000 yards or meters above the ground. Co-fired electrical generating plants, cars and factories dump greenhouse gases and poisonous gases into the lowest 100 yards or meters of the atmosphere and raise its temperature. When the wind stops for a few days near industrial centers, entire towns are sickened and many persons die from factory exhaust. Why do factories have tall smokestacks? They are used to disperse the poisons higher into the air that might otherwise kill everyone walking past. Our very lives depend on the temperature of the lowest 10,000 yards or meters of the atmosphere 
because that is where we live. We risk global death by altering this temperature with air pollution. The temperature of outer space is minus 450 Fahrenheit or minus 270 centigrade. This is the temperature above the Earth's atmosphere, which is merely 30 miles or 50 kilometers tall. That short distance above your head, the cold temperature would kill you in seconds. We human beings are able to live only in the lowest mile or two of the atmosphere, where the temperature is just right. The Earth's human population of 7 billion persons amounts to 35 persons per square kilometer. This means that each person gets a square region that is 160 yards or meters on a side. Out of the entire universe, the only place where you can live above freezing is in this little volume that is 160 by 160 yards or meters and a few miles or kilometers in height. Don't let anyone save pennies by dumping greenhouse gases and poisons into your tiny little livable volume of the universe. Factory-made global warming began 250 years ago. As was stated above, scientists and engineers would be thrilled to design and build factories, homes, and cars that emit nothing into the environment so that we won't be gambling with global death. Factory owners prefer to save pennies by leaving out the equipment needed to keep their factories from emitting pollution and fouling our air and water. Business owners have made obscene profits polluting the world. Had they built proper processing facilities, they would have simply charged customers more. The nation's 500 billionaires and their media and political advocates care only to save pennies on buildings and operating costs and have no regard for the lives of 7 billion persons or of any other life on earth. The billionaire Warren Buffett said, I personally think that if society is the one that's benefiting from the reduction of greenhouse gases, that society should pick up the tab. In response, we personally think that we should fine and jail those business leaders who hope to reduce factory operating costs by emitting greenhouse gases and poisons into the air and water. Even they will benefit if we avoid global death. Antarctica has one and a half times the area of the U.S. and it is covered by ice that is 6,000 yards or meters thick. Imagine the entire U.S. covered by mile thick ice. You can believe that the ocean level would rise if all that ice was pushed into the sea and melted. As ice ages come and go, the ocean surface rises and falls through 100 yards or meters as water cycles between ocean and glaciers. Each coal-fired electrical generating plant burns 100 to 500 train car loads of coal per day and there are thousands of these plants. They emit more radiation than a nuclear powered plant they emit the mercury that is in our waters and food supply, and their emissions cause lung disease. Half the world's greenhouse gases are emitted by electrical generating plants that burn fossil fuels. Out of the 7 billion of us on Earth, the only people who want smog, lung disease, global warming, and mercury in our food are the owners of this industry. Each coal-fired electrical generating plant burns a mountain of coal every year. In contrast, a nuclear-powered electrical generating plant gets its energy from a piece of uranium that is the size of a beach ball, and each plant creates but several truckloads of nuclear waste per year. Which is better for the environment and our health, coal or nuclear-powered plants? We must be careful to make the correct and fully informed choice. We all want to use solar, wind, tidal, and other renewables for as great a share of our energy as possible. Europe is way ahead of the U.S. in this approach. A great plan is to use windmills to charge batteries that operate electrical cars for every person. It would take a couple decades to switch to electric cars, just as it took a couple decades, back in the 1930s and 40s, to get electricity and plumbing into homes and gas stations along paved roads. Japan already has more electrical charging stations than gas stations. Our political leaders have failed us by not planning for our future energy needs and energy systems, by omitting mass transportation, even sidewalks. Back in 1975, 
We should have put wind power generators and solar collectors on every rooftop in the planet. To see how passive solar energy works, lay a water-filled hose or container for an hour in the sun or in your closed car and you will quickly have hot water for a shower. Rather than using light bulbs all day long, sunlight should be piped inward for interior lighting. The absence of a U.S. energy policy, since that of President Carter, has accompanied two Gulf Wars and 500,000 of us human beings being killed by other human beings. El Nino is a one degree Fahrenheit or half a degree centigrade warming in a patch of ocean along the equator and this shifts weather patterns around the globe. Global warming might raise the entire Earth's surface temperature by an average of four degrees Fahrenheit or two degrees centigrade. This also means that the temperature in big cities might increase by 10 degrees Fahrenheit or 5 degrees centigrade. Throughout the summer, the temperature in your city might be 110 degrees Fahrenheit, 43 centigrade, instead of 100 degrees Fahrenheit, 38 centigrade. We, the human beings of the world, instruct our business and political leaders that, from now on, homes, cars, and factories will be built such that they emit nothing into the environment. That way we won't be gambling with global debt just to save a few pennies for a few billionaires. In conclusion about business, I say shame on those business leaders who strive to pay employees as little as possible and take as much money as possible from each of 7 billion persons. That's what it means to charge what the market will bear. The greediest of us seek the slightest benefit for ourselves by adding a little misery to the lives of 7 billion others. The billionaire dreams, if I cut every employee's pay by $1 per hour, then I would soon have another billion for myself. If I cut their pay by half and double the selling price, then I would quickly have 10 billion more for myself. The billionaire believes that, I deserve this for myself because I have given them jobs and allow them the privilege of being my customer and buying things from me. In reality, our purchases are the income of the billionaires. Corporate profit is the income of the upper 0.01% of us. Whenever you hear a 0.01 or talk, answer, you just want it all for yourself even if it kills the other 7 billion of us. The billionaire dreams of merging the last few competitors so that they could charge the gouging prices that they deserve to have. While about five companies control each industry, construction is necessarily local so it has not been monopolized. There are about 60,000 home builders and remodelers in the U.S. There should be 60,000 independent businesses in each industry, but we have only five. Through 2016, monopolization has made 1,800 billionaires on the planet by increasing wealth concentration and inequality. This causes daily misery and divorce for one in six of us in the U.S. who do not have enough income to buy food and pay rent. Our billionaires would like the sole purpose of civilization to be to turn them into trillionaires before they die. They would like to remove any law that gets in their way of their own profit. In reality, we all know that the purpose of our mutual civilization matches the meaning of life of a human being, which is firstly, to ensure the well-being and happiness of our children. What's good for our children is good for the nation, for society, and for human civilization. It took some 5,000 years which is the first half of human civilization, for Mesopotamian farming villages to grow to population levels of a few hundred thousand persons. The people of the first cities had to invent the urban ways that are still much the same today anywhere on the planet. These farming villages lived in peace for 5,000 years. No war occurred throughout this time period. War is not in human nature and it is not a permanent part of civilization. As Mesopotamian city regions grew large enough to overlap and begin to quarrel over intermediate territory and water, then we invented the emperor and the empire, military forces, and wars of mass murder. 
Our first ever emperor somehow convinced his people that it will be glorious to go to another city and kill hundreds and even thousands of persons. Imagine what would have been your reaction to the news of the first ever massacre of thousands of persons. It is no coincidence that this is a time in which religion becomes moral instruction. Our most important spiritual leaders, including Moses, Jesus, Buddha, and Muhammad emerged soon after the development of large, stranger-filled cities, empires, and wars of mass murder. Our moral leaders re-emphasized our love for each other and our golden social rule. After the first emperor existed, many other kings said, What? You can do that? I want to have an empire just like him, only bigger. War was invented to create empires. A few generations after the first empire wars, people had already come to assume that war has always occurred, but actually, war has existed only through the second half of civilization, and war has always been the idea of our leader seeking to expand his own wealth and power for his own benefit at the cost of terrible deaths for other people by tearing away arms, legs, and heads. In each region of the world, empires grew in size and duration up through the last century. Once you've seen one pattern of sloshing kingdoms and empires, you've seen them all. The so-called winning army was simply the largest army. The purpose of government, ever since the first chiefdoms, has always been to organize our mutual efforts. Together and with such leadership, we accomplish civilization. But the newly invented emperor demanded that we kill and be killed so that he can expand his empire. Bernanski and Maslisch point out that a person will not come to your home and say, I must kill you for your food to feed my children. We all agree that this person's lack of food is no excuse for such immoral behavior. But some kings believe that morality does not apply to them and will kill to obtain territory, raw materials, or any other object of interest. For the last 5,000 years, we have let rulers answer to no one while causing much death. We, the human beings of the world, now tell our leaders that we will conduct no more war. Our nature is to be loving and nurturing parents, not mortal combatants as a favor for kings. Love and children, not empires, stir our being. We, the human beings of the world, don't care about being emperor. That does not stir our emotions, but children do. War is not innate human behavior, but love is. We love our children. They drive our very existence. 
We will do anything just to see them smile. We devote every effort of our lives to the well-being and nurtured growth of our children. We see that we are not yet fully in control of our political leaders when they continue their 5,000 year old habit of going to war on a whim as they hope to expand their own wealth and power through the terrible death of other people. Family members might have their limbs blown off while eating at the dinner table. In the last century, war kills more civilians than combatants. For example, in just the first Gulf War, several hundred thousand human beings were killed. Most were civilians, of which half are children. The next time your leader promotes war and mass murder, simply say no because it means the murder of thousands of children. Some political leaders seek power through war and do not care that it means the death of 100,000 people. Do you know how to end war today? Fill the television with images of people screaming and crying because their arms have been blown off and their child's legs have been severed. Do you know how to keep a war going once it has started? Keep these images off the television. The price of such a terrible lie is a terrible death for innocent people. War and its injustice will occur only for as long as we let our leaders demand it, and only for as long as we go along with them. For too long we've been letting leaders cause murder. We, the human beings of the world, now agree that the nations of the world must immediately capture and imprison any leader who causes an attack on people in his region or in any other region. There's no reason for us to conduct war with that leader's military. This causes large numbers of terrible deaths. We will instead arrest that leader. Our would-be emperors can instead live together in one prison. Of the seven billion of us today, only a handful are dreaming of world conquest through war. We, the human beings of the world, tell our leaders that we will no longer conduct their wars. We will not let a handful of leaders start war and kill millions of persons this century. We now choose to glorify nurturing and kindness, not war, violence, and profit. Rather than just outlawing guns for the public, let's follow the Dalai Lama's advice and take guns away from every army. In fact, let's remove every army from our planet. Our most selfish leaders will then be less deadly. What purpose do guns and armies serve today? Mostly they prolong injustice. As the first group of 100,000 of us head to live on Mars, will we have to take armies, guns, and bombs with us? For what purpose? To protect us from aliens or from the conquest-minded leaders? Of the trillion dollars spent on tanks, planes, and ships throughout World War II, 10% of this money was the business profits that went to a few hundred persons who owned most of the stock of a few dozen war companies. Despite Eisenhower's warning, U.S. military spending has increased such that it now spends as much as does the rest of the world combined. Through the last 50 years, the U.S. military has conducted actions in 50 of the 200 nations of the world. No other country does this. U.S. politicians constantly state that they should choose the leaders of other nations. This makes people mad at the U.S. While campaigning for president in the year 2000, George W. Bush said that foreign policy is easy, just stop doing things that make other nations mad at us. A few years later he said that great nations go to war. With the trillion dollars spent on the Iraq war, 
the U.S. could have instead funded complete health care and education for all 80 million of its citizens under the age of 21, spending $12,000 for each of them. The people of the U.S. do not have affordable health care or college. Instead, our leaders choose to spend our mutual money on a really big military force. In 2015, U.S. military spending was $0.6 trillion, which is the same money that all 50 states spend on K-12 education for 50 million students attending 100,000 public K-12 schools. These schools are funded by state, local, and a little federal tax. While high school graduation rates are near 100% in Europe and Asia, it has been 75% in the U.S. for years but suddenly grew to 80% in the last few years. U.S. citizens pay much more than do Europeans in the total spend on taxes, college, health care, babysitting, and retirement and such. Europeans chose to share costs for these things that everyone needs in today's society and view the fees to be membership dues in a societal contract. Those of us humans and social primates who live in the U.S. are still members of a society, but might imagine that it's everyone for themselves. U.S. students pay $15,000 per year at public colleges or $50,000 per year at private colleges, but students in Europe pay nothing or at most $3,000 per year to attend the best schools. While U.S. students graduate with an average of $30,000 of student loan debt and owe another $30,000 in interest, Europeans graduate with no debt. Many U.S. students borrow $100,000 and pay back $200,000. Banks enjoy having no risk as the loans cannot be removed even by bankruptcy. As of 2016, student loan debt in the U.S. is massive totaling 15% as much as is owed on all homes combined. Some parents borrowed money against their home to pay for their children's college. To be fully educated today requires graduating from college because the harsh reality is that high school prepares you only for jobs that a sixth grader could have done. But going to college requires more money than intelligence. If you grow up in a poor side of town in the U.S., then you have a 9% chance of having college. But 77% of more wealthy children attend college. This happens because, as we saw above, K-12 schools in the U.S. obtain half their funding from local taxes. And this means that schools in poor districts have less funding for K-12, so its children are taught less. By the way, there is no such thing as smart and dumb people because each of us has the intelligence needed to fit into our brain the 30,000 details of culture comprising our recipes for how to do everything in daily life. Our K-12 system strives to tailor educational delivery to each individual student but forces all students to travel through the school years at the same rate. About one-third of our children are interested in learning at a 30% faster pace, shrinking K-12 to plus four years of college into 12 years so that we finish college at age 18 and obtain PhDs at age 22. Today, it is our 20-year-olds who are advancing civilization. We, the people of the world, Know that we and our leaders are failing our children if college education is not free and available for every child on the planet. Our civilization has many Rembrandts and Einsteins who cannot pay corporate prices for education. We are all better off to have everyone's full contribution to society. Some politicians in the U.S. have stated that the government does not belong in the education industry and talk of ending publicly funded K-12 education. The trouble is that business would quickly monopolize this widget industry and create huge profits for a few corporations who would have one live teacher per school and one teacher broadcasting online to all 50 million children in the U.S. 
Cost would be very little, but the price would be half of your monthly income. Charter schools do not compete or submit bids to teach students at lower cost to citizens. Instead, they are simply given the same money that would have gone to the nearest public school. In those nations that require families to pay directly to attend school, about one-third of children do not attend because the price can be half of family income. The result is that one-third of voting citizens are illiterate, as would happen in the U.S., were K-12 schools to be controlled by a few corporations. The nation's 500 billionaires and their political and media advocates dream of eliminating the $600 billion per year taxes needed to fund schools and instead milking billions in profits from parents who want their children to be educated. As public funding for public colleges decreased by $10 billion from 2008 to 2016, Tuition has risen by as much as 50 to 80 percent. As colleges have become more businesslike, tuition has greatly increased through the last 30 years. Those of us who do not finish high school have little choice in occupation, are forced to take whichever job comes along, and struggle to buy food and pay rent. The Marinkoffs explain that our high school dropout rate affects the lives of individuals and their children through reduced wages, reduced civic participation, and higher unemployment. This chart shows average weekly wages for full-time workers in 2016 and the unemployment rate versus educational attainment. The wage of high school dropouts is about the same as the poverty wage for a family of four. The economic benefit of education makes for trite bake compared with the rewards that come from knowledge and knowledgeable citizens. Education gives us knowledge from the experience of billions of persons through thousands of years. Education today is more than job training at public expense and more than an introduction to the 5,000-year-old skills of reading, writing, and arithmetic, which are the three misspelled R's. It produces an understanding of the math and science and the arts and humanities that result in an appreciation of human beings, our cultures, and our civilization, and results in a respect for all human beings and for the civilization that we humans are building. Knowing something about the nature of humans and the flow of our civilization helps us to better choose our combined future. An illiterate population is robbed of the knowledge of the extensive accomplishments of humans and instead might imagine that the community appeared from nowhere and that its future is beyond our control. A nation's progress is tied to the education of its citizens. With each new thing we learn or accomplish, we become a fuller person, a more engaged citizen, and contribute more to our mutual society. Having college education for everyone is a meaningful step toward our destination of the fully empowering civilization that combines all that is possible from every person. Increased education is in the interest of our civilization. No other investment would bring a comparable increase in the quality of our lives. In the United States, about one quarter of us complete college but about one in ten of us cannot afford to attend any college at all and so are not being allowed to contribute all that they can to our mutual community. Students in the U.S. sometimes ask, what good will this fact do me in life? What is the answer? I want to learn this so that I can understand human beings in our world and accomplishments. Graduate from high school. Go to college. Have a job live a comfortable life with my family, and contribute all that I can to our mutual society and civilization. While people in the U.S. are taught that they might be a zillionaire, Europeans are taught that together we ensure a comfortable life. Through the last century, an increasing portion of the world's people have been contributing to our rapid growth in technology. Here is a UNESCO map that shows the number of researchers per nation per 1 million inhabitants. 
Imagine the pace of our progress when every human being on the planet is allowed to contribute. Though only males were allowed to be citizens, every male citizen in Athens was allowed to give his view during official public meetings. Women were not allowed to take part. Athenian democracy originated in response to the growing oppression of city residents by the rich few. The first step toward citizen shared power was taken in the year 594 BC by the leader Solon. He complained that the unrighteous, privileged leaders could not restrain their excesses and grew rich by stealing for themselves. Solon warned that the widespread economic exploitation, discontent, corruption, and indifference of the powerful was in danger of causing civil strife or even tyranny. He said that he wanted to restrain and correct this unjust situation. The dramatic change then occurred in Greece as part of society became involved in overseas trade with the older Middle Eastern states. This portion of the people began to accumulate and display a great wealth and luxury that was furiously denounced by the people of Athens. The people said those who have the most today want twice as much tomorrow and that wealth makes one mad, has no object but itself, and is insatiable. At the root of wealth is a corrupted disposition, a perverse will. Wealth would bring injustice, oppression, and disorder by enslaving the masses. The people represented civic values as opposed to rich extravagance. Their new democratic wisdom would bring moderation, proportion, fair limits, the golden mean, and nothing in the extreme. You may have heard of the ancient Greek tyrants. A tyrant was a town boss who could have his way because he owned much of the town. Foreign trade had brought excessive wealth and social and economic injustice, and in response, the Assembly of Equal Citizens was created. The citizens were equal in that law now applied equally to all. Each citizen could take part in the Assembly, and each person's vote counted equally. Each person could also take any other person to court. In several ways, democracy in ancient Athens was more extensive than today's version. For one thing, the daily operations of the city, down to the smallest detail, were discussed in public meetings or assemblies. The entire voting public would meet to decide whether or not to construct a building and who would be paid to do the construction, or whether or not to send a cargo ship to a certain port. They would also decide whether their city would go to war with another city. When the citizens voted for war, they knew that they themselves would be the soldiers who would fight and die. Each citizen was allowed to stand and speak during assembly meetings. While talking, the speaker stood on this platform and faced his fellow citizens and the Acropolis. Each speaker was expected to express his views in a short and to-the-point message. Each man could speak only once per issue and would be ridiculed if he talked too long or strayed from the issue. The leading citizens were those whose advice regularly proved to be good. These men were often expected to speak so that other citizens would know and follow their advised course of action. A person was allowed to speak for only a few minutes as timed by letting water drain from this upper pot into the lower one. An experienced speaker would talk to the last drop. After this public debate, decisions were obtained by counting votes cast by a show of hands. The citizens met in an assembly to vote on the issues of the week. There were about 40 assembly meetings per year. The nearly weekly issues were pre-selected by a council of 500 citizens, each of whom were selected by lot to serve for one year. Names were placed in the slots of this board, and then one name was randomly selected. The city of Athens was divided into ten districts, and to better guarantee a cross-section of people throughout the city, the council of 500 consisted of 50 persons from each of these ten regions. 
Before each meeting, the council posted the current issues for all to see and discuss. Literacy and public debate were essential. Any citizen could propose a new law or action, but if it were shown to be inconsistent with previous laws, he would lose his citizenship rights for a few years. Citizens were paid a small fee to attend the assembly meeting so that it would be attended by all, not by just those wealthy enough to have free time. How are new laws proposed, debated, and approved in your nation today? Democracy in ancient Athens was also more extensive than today's version in that individual involvement occurred as citizens took turns holding various offices. There were no elected officials in ancient Athens. Instead, governmental positions, such as those of the councillors, were filled by random drawings. The selected person served for about a year, and no person could serve twice in their lifetime. Where the knowledge of professionals was needed, there would be permanent positions, but most governmental positions were temporary. Many Athenians felt that the benefits of a more experienced politician and official would be spoiled by a growth in corruption. Today we sometimes find that long-term positions for career politicians leads to aspirations of power and selfish actions. Today's democracy consists of elections of professional, lifelong politicians who are hired to make our daily decisions for us. Since we have the technology today to make decisions by a show of hands through the internet, for example, it seems to be a safe bet that a change will be coming to today's more limited form of democracy. Trials were also decided by the vote of the citizens. Murder trials were held outdoors on the top of this hill so that it was readily seen by all. Before the time of democracy, if one didn't have wealth and influence, it was hard to get access to justice. It was also hard to get justice from wealthy persons because they were conducting the court. Athenian democracy placed the administration of the courts into the hands of the citizens. There were no paid politicians. There were no paid professional judges, and there were no paid district attorneys. The judge and jury were amateurs. The jury were judges of facts and law, and they determined verdicts and penalties. The number of jurymen depended on the severity of the charges. Every 60-year-old citizen was required to be available to serve as a court arbitrator. He was an ordinary person, but had considerable experience of life. At any time, there were several of these arbitrators. Each case was assigned by lot to one of those arbitrators. Anyone could bring a court charge against any other person. Do you feel today that you could take court action against any person or corporation, which is an organization of persons that have done you wrong? A convicted defendant would be fined, lose his civic rights or property, or even his life. The accuser was rewarded if his case was won. However, the accusers would have to pay a fee if they failed to get at least 20% of the jury to agree that the defendant was guilty. Each year, about 3% of citizens were serving in the government. Through any 25-year period, one quarter to one-third of the citizens had served in their government. And each year, 15 to 20 percent of Athenian citizens were registered to serve in the courts. Today's parliament and assembly members consist of a much smaller portion of the population, and each member tries to serve permanently. It is also true that the members are not a cross-section of the people of a nation. Do you think people today would like to be randomly selected and paid to serve a one-year term in an assembly? More so than it does today, Athenian democracy meant self-government, individual involvement, participation, and random representation in the daily decision-making process. There was everywhere an ingrained suspicion of the corruptive effects of power. Their system was inefficient in time and labor, unprofessional, cumbersome, uncoordinated, and plagued by annual discontinuity. But ever since have the citizens held full control over their daily operation of their own city and government. 
the people of Athens had total control over the legislative, executive, and judicial portions of their government because the people of Athens were the government. The citizens felt that they were in charge of their own affairs. There was no feeling of us versus them as occurs in some of today's representational governments of career politicians. The Athenians knew that only 30 miles away, government was very different. Let's have a closer look at democracy to see what it is and to see which aspects of a people's culture and history will make democracy a suitable and stable type of government for them. Democracy is more than elections and voting and more than free speech and civil liberties. Democracy is first of all a blending of views that partially satisfies everyone while single party states outlaw all points of view that are contrary to those of the ruling person or party. Democratic nations have multiple parties and groups who propose policy and then conduct debate and compromise until a consensus is constructed. The process involves political parties, interest groups, and members of the media, elite, military, business, religious, university, labor, property class, radical left and right, centrist, environmental, scientific, families and professionals, but rarely the poorest of us. The elite of a nation consists of its most prominent individuals, including lawyers, doctors, journalists, intellectuals, and politicians, along with its religious and business leaders. Within each group, there is a range of viewpoints. With each of the following statements about democratic culture, decide if it describes the people of your nation. Citizens of a democratic culture have tolerance for different views and lifestyles and believe in the right of dissent. Undemocratic citizens might instead accuse dissenters of being unpatriotic. While the citizens of a monarchy have a confidence in benevolent kings and queens, the members of a democracy must distrust power and instead trust in the motives and intelligence of fellow citizens. Democratic citizens have an ever watchful attitude toward authority rather than blind submission or a fatalistic acceptance of the actions of the leaders and the rules of the state. Citizens have an intelligent distrust of leadership but they are not hostile toward it. Authority must be questioned and challenged so that it does not become dictatorial, but it must also be supported or it will dissolve. Because of this distress, power is spread and balanced among the branches of government and among many persons within each branch. This also means that the views, priorities, and agenda of no single person or group can monopolize the actions of the government. Much of daily politicking, including public statements and television ads, consists of the attempt to persuade a sufficient number of others that a specific action should be taken by the nation. Daily politicking has become the science of getting one's way. Democratic citizens believe that the state is responsive to their requests, but they must participate in the debate before they can measure the responsiveness of their system. The more involved are the citizens, the stronger will be their democracy. Democracy is most appropriate and durable in a nation whose citizens have a working level of knowledge in politics and who participate in political affairs, form political opinions and then express them through participation in public debates and organizations. Consider education for all to be beneficial to the nation as a whole. Desire economic development. Have political beliefs and attitudes rather than apathy toward everything political. Have a belief in the legitimacy of the state. Have any personal trust for the other members. 
Do not view government as a caring and trusted parent or as an institution that has the divine right to rule. Have goals for the nation. Reject revolutionary change and instead use the existing system to make changes. Want to cooperate and compromise rather than suffer civil war. And have trust in their mutually beneficial system and gain enough personal satisfaction from its existence to support it while it is temporarily performing poorly. For example, during an economic recession. Restraining one's ideology allows results to occur, otherwise there is nothing but deadlock. It is undemocratic behavior for citizens to feel that they can demand their own way, be uncompromising, and require that everyone be just like them or else. Compromise makes all parties partial winners rather than having clear winners and clear losers. We see that within dictatorial or single party states, a single person or party controls governmental plans and actions, while in democracies, plans develop through the gelling of consensus after an open debate of the views of all persons and groups. Democracy is more than voting and free speech. It is a blending of views that partially satisfies each person and group. Citizens are their own bosses and critics. Citizen critics loudly judge the performance of their government in socialization, education, economic growth, social reform, the maintenance of law and order, its respect for the rules of the game, and its ability to govern invisibly and to achieve legitimacy. How well do you rate the level of performance of your own government today? The U.S. Bill of Rights contains a list of specific oppressions performed by the kings and queens of previous centuries. The Bill of Rights of South Africa was written between 1993 and 1997 and is even more thorough. Democracy is more than voting in rights. It requires a blending of views that partially satisfies everyone or else it ends. Here is a list of the number of political parties in the nations of the world. Most nations have a couple dozen parties, but just a few of them typically receive most of the votes. In effect, the U.S. has just two parties who maintain a shared monopoly. What is the difference between authoritarian and democratic systems? Democracy is a blending of views that partially satisfies everyone, while dictatorial governments have a single party with a single view of goals and priorities. This single party forces the nation down a single path by outlawing all other parties, views, and paths. Imagine how your nation would be quickly transformed if only a single party made all decisions without debate. For example, if the U.S. had only the Democratic Party or only the Republican Party, about half the citizens would be very happy and the other half would be very mad. Single party states are able to make more rapid decisions and are and effect more rapid change than is possible under the slow debate of multi-party states, but only some of its citizens are happy with the result. In an authoritarian state, there is but one view of the role and priorities of the state because all other views are outlawed. Anyone promoting alternative views is punished. The authoritarian state tries to control all political, economic, and social activity and has even become the leader's attempt for total mind control. Here is a list of several of the hundreds of petitions presented by U.S. citizens showing concern about any and all issues. In the single party state, no organization of any kind can be created without first obtaining the permission of the government. 
No organization is allowed to compete with the state or disagree with the state or serve any function that the state is already providing. An approved group is given a meeting place and allowed to publicize its goals and events and to collect dues. Those persons taking part in any unauthorized organization that is attempting to be autonomous of the state will be either fined, jailed, or expelled from one's profession or from the country. These punishments usually keep the number of active dissidents very low. Single party states and dictators might jail or kill opponents. If people do not agree with the dictator's confiscation of the nation, then he chops off their head on Main Street in front of everyone. This works very well in keeping the rest of us silent. It is very effective because people will not risk their lives over anything less than the lack of food for their children. Such mind control is a new thing from the last century. In previous centuries, kings and queens did not kill people for speaking their minds. Governmental systems are also a part of our culture. The only form of government that seems natural to a people is that in which they grew. Whether it is a kingdom, dictatorship, theocracy, or democracy. For this reason, it takes one or two generations for a people to believe in a new type of government. Force never works. <laughs> Democracy cannot be forced onto a people by simply telling them that today, you will have elections and free speech. Instead, democracy's blending of views has to be part of the life and culture of a group of people. In the U.S. today, we vote for president as if we're voting for the person who can dictate all laws, policies, and actions. But the president has to convince 500 legislators and judges to agree. Hedrick Smith recommends that we ask presidential candidates not only to state their goals, but to explain how the legislators will be convinced to go along. The president can set the agenda and tone of the nation. In the last couple decades, the majority party in the U.S. House and Senate has tried to limit the participation of the minority party in the legislative process. The majority party hopes to get its way by taking us towards single party rule between elections. Today we have corporate directed news channels in the political flavor of your choice. To maximize profit, each news corporation gets a room full of people having the same political views and asks them, what makes you really mad? The answers of the test audience become the topics presented on the news channel. This maximizes the viewing audience size and hence the sales of oatmeal commercials, which makes the profit of the corporate news channel. For example, a test audience might answer that they get mad when thinking of welfare people who buy drugs. So that becomes an hour-long discussion on the news channel. The discussion does not include possible causes or solutions, but is meant only to make viewers mad. The channel's topics are carefully chosen to upset viewers and make them addicted to the pain. Even the presentation of weather forecasts can be made to evoke fear. The channel might state that it is windy at the equator today and ask, will this grow into a storm that kills you tomorrow? Stay tuned. The solution is to turn off those channels. About 1 in 10 U.S. citizens has keen interest in politics and follows every daily nuance. In contrast, too many of us will simply vote for the person with the nicest smile or the most familiar single-line statement. Too many U.S. citizens feel that it is my way or nothing. The corporate news channels are fueling this, but the opposite of compromise is civil war. U.S. intolerance and refusal to compromise is driving the nation to civil war between those who want government to protect us from injustice and those who want to eliminate government and instead let business run the nation and do whatever it wants to increase profit. Historically, war ends when people tire of daily death and destruction 
and decide that compromise is not so bad after all. There is daily discussion of the greed of the world, but that involves just a fraction of us. For example, the 0.01% of us who demonstrate zero empathy for other human beings. For them, customer deaths matter only in terms of dollars lost in lawsuits. Ask any other human being on the planet what drives our existence and they will answer children and spouse, love and family, and community and justice. These concerns were built into our DNA millions of years ago as we are parenting mammals, social primates, and cultural human beings. The business world is a new thing that does not indicate our average genes, and we have not suddenly become independent of our genetic heritage. What should be the priorities and goals for the mutual efforts that are our society and civilization? These can only match the meaning of life of a human being, which is firstly to ensure the well-being and happiness of our children. We live for our children. What's good for our children is good for the nation, for society, and for human civilization. As mentioned above, about one in five children in the U.S. live in a home whose income falls below the poverty line. This situation has steadily existed through recent decades. The U.S. ranking in infant mortality was 12th best in the world in 1960, but has fallen to 56 in 2016. What could possibly be more important than the survival of our babies and the well-being of our children? But this is not the priority of our politicians. In the U.S. we now have two war departments, defense and homeland security. But we do not have something that we might refer to as the Department of Children's Well-Being, or the Department of Life, or the Department of Happy and Healthy Children and Communities. The portion of governmental efforts that are directed at our children's well-being is shown by the portion of last year's legislation as recorded in the Congressional Roll Call that directly involved children. Very frequently, tell your leaders what you think the priority should be for our mutual efforts and tell them when their actions and policies do not match our human priorities for healthy and happy children and communities. Should the priority of our government be to turn a handful of our billionaires into trillionaires before they die, just like the rest of us? For us human beings, our infant mortality rate is of utmost importance, not the gross national product, which sums value added in everything purchased, including the money spent on car wrecks, divorce fees, crime, sickness, police forces, and prisons. These expenditures are considered to be economic progress and growth. In contrast, the social health indicators measure our well-being and the quality of our lives. The Marengoffs quote Senator Robert F. Kennedy's full description of the gross national product. Here is an excerpt. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. The news tells us second-by-second second changes in the Dow average, but we want to see second-by-second second values for hundreds of social indicators, including infant mortality, child poverty, suicide, income and wealth inequality high school and college graduation rates, elderly poverty, affordable health care, affordable housing and utilities, and even happiness. Bhutan's government states that its purpose is to improve the National Happiness Index and that this is more important than its gross national product. Each day, ask yourself, what do you want out of life? What are meaningful goals and priorities for the mutual efforts that are our city, national, and global societies? The purpose of government has always been to direct our mutual efforts. Eliminating government would mean that we have no mutual efforts. 
but a lone person cannot accomplish monumental tasks. Even the billionaire needs the other seven billion persons from which money can be taken. How do you define happiness and well-being, and how can they be measured? One might say that they involve surviving birth and infancy and then having a long and healthy life not shortened by a simple curable illness. Receiving the desired amount of education. Not being abused and not having such a bleak expectation of the future that we turn to drugs, crime, or suicide. We expect to enjoy our job and that it is rewarding and fulfilling. We do not want to feel that we are being treated as a machine or tool. We expect to work a number of hours per week and spend the rest with our family, friends, and the neighbors of our community. Having hobbies and time and money to spend on them helps us feel human as does having a quality neighborhood and community, and a global community too. We want to have control over our own life, and have goals in life, and goals for the nation and planet. We want to be paid enough that just a portion of our income is spent on food, clothing, housing, utilities, health, and entertainment, and to have enough money to handle sudden expenses. We do not want to die in poverty. We prefer to maintain a level of comfort throughout retirement. We do not want to have our quality of life restricted or decreased for the benefit of another person. We do not want to be the victim of crime. We do not want to be the victim of war. Our happiness can be measured indirectly by measuring a large number of such aspects of life. The Maringoffs explain that the social health indicators quantify the success of our mutual efforts to make life better for all of us, which is the stated purpose of government. Poor rates indicate problems of society, not private misfortune. For example, one in five of the children of the U.S. live in a home whose income is below the poverty line, but politicians rarely discuss this with us, and it appears in the news only on occasion. We should be having a national debate about the priorities for the mutual efforts that comprise our society and civilization. Using numerous social indicators, we can measure the success of our attempts to govern ourselves. We can even measure our happiness. Which measures of our well-being and quality of life are most important to you, to your fellow citizens, and to the current leaders of your business and government? The Maringoffs explain that a national debate about social health indicators would strengthen our democracy, help guide public policy, make more specific our vague notions of well-being, increase our understanding of the fabric that joins us as a society, re-emphasize that we are defined not only by a series of achievements, but also by the quality of our social interactions, inspire us to greater participation in government, make us feel that our government officials are once again concerned about us and are responsive to our needs, move us beyond the measurement of nothing but money gained or lost, expand our concern for the essential conditions of society, and help us to see our society as a whole that is composed of health, religion, urban, rural life, birth and retirement, recreation, arts, family, and social and economic matters. We would then better see that public policy is a mutual agreement about mutual concerns and that our policies are able to change the quality of our lives. This effort requires measuring, monitoring, debating, policy making, and law making to continually improve the lives of all of us. The United Nations says that human development is about much more than the rise or fall of national incomes. It is about creating an environment in which people can develop their full potential and lead productive, creative lives in accord with their needs and interests. People are the real wealth of nations. The most basic capabilities for human development are to lead long and healthy lives, to be knowledgeable, to have access to the resources needed for a decent standard of living, and to be able to participate in the life of the community. Without these, many choices are simply not available, and many opportunities in life remain 
inaccessible. The social health indicators tell us if our governmental policies and actions are or are not making life better for all of us. This is the only reason that each of us contributes our lifetime's effort in building and operating our mutual civilization. Do you know how to tell if your government is doing a good job and expending efforts for everyone? There will be improvements in our social health indicators. The indicators enable us to find the policies and actions that prove to minimize social and economic injustice and maximize the well-being and the quality of life for as many of us as possible. With each successive generation, we will move closer to the most just form for our civilization. We are not there yet, but we human beings will not rest until we have obtained the fully just civilization. A quantitative measure of the injustice of our civilization is given by the percentage of us who live in poverty or are constrained from pursuing the limits of our talents and capabilities, and by the percentage of us who are imprisoned or employed in military and police forces or have our lives upset by war, as some of our leaders still amuse themselves by going to war on a whim. Injustice and the selfish greed of our leaders is curtailing progress and holding us back from the level of well-being that we could have already attained. For the first time in the history of civilization, we are able to tell our leaders what should be our priorities for local, national, and global pooling of efforts. We no longer have to let our political and business leaders set priorities to simply expand the wealth and power of only the wealthiest of us. It is a safe bet that within a few years we will use the internet to vote by a show of hands for priorities for our government, to choose budget sources and expenditures, and to choose which quality of life indicators will be used in measuring our progress. With each successive generation there will be a continued shift in the concerns of government and civilization towards the concerns of a human being, which are love and families and community and justice and away from the attempt to amass power and wealth for a few of us. Nature made us human, and from this beginning we continue to form the culture and build the civilization of our own choosing, constrained only by human imagination and human nature. Our civilization is made by us human beings, for us human beings, and it represents us human beings. Our civilization will be whatever we choose to make of it. If you ask every person on the planet what our first global task should be, most will answer that water, food, toilets, and shelter are needed to keep us alive. Worldwide, about one in six of us must go to the bathroom outside on the ground. Such basic necessities of life are missing, even though we can remedy this problem with little global effort and tremendous reward. A greedy landlord actually charges rent to live in such homes. One in six of us human beings live in the world's slums, and this means that one in six of the world's Rembrandts and Einsteins live in the world's slums. When our civilization restrains lives, then those persons cannot contribute all that they could, and our civilization is less than it could be. College education and health care for all seven billion of us is a meaningful goal for our mutual efforts. These are not luxuries. They have become part of our civilization. To not have college education and health care takes us back to the world of previous centuries. They are not meant to be a way for business to gouge us half our income. These global tasks are easily accomplished when all of us, especially our leaders, decide to begin. By thinking only of themselves, some of our political and business leaders are unnecessarily holding all of us back from the more rapid progress on the goals most meaningful to all of us. And we are unnecessarily holding ourselves back by not telling them that we know what they are up to. Seven billion of us are burdened with extra gouging from the non-empathetic 0.01 percenters. Seven billion of us measure success in life in terms of happy and healthy children, families, and communities. For us, daily life means the constant exchange of loving kindness, as we have been doing for millions of years. 
Our scientific and technological understandings have recently made life easier and less often shortened for some, but not all of us. When a person's income today is so low that antibiotic, phone, car, education, and health care are unaffordable, then that person is being forced to live a medieval lifestyle while being surrounded by 21st century benefits. Our industrial revolution has also brought increased inequality and injustice and lessened social ties in the community. Cities had minuscule sized police forces before industrialization and we now have a mechanical ability to kill people by the millions during war. Typically around the world there are many wars and millions of war refugees but little of this is discussed in the US news. Neither is this. We don't fight crime by continually increasing the size of our armies and police forces. We fight crime by striving to minimize hopelessness, the unequal access to the benefits of civilization, and social and economic injustice, because these things are the sources of misery and the resulting crime. Together we will look carefully at the unjust causes of poverty and despair and use the strength of our human character striving to create a more just civilization for all of us. As we begin to use hundreds of social health indicators to measure the success of our attempts at governing ourselves, we will find the approach that minimizes hopelessness and injustice, crime, poverty, and escape through drug usage. The increasingly just society requires that every governmental policy and action prove to reduce measured social and economic injustice and improve our mutual lives. Allowing people to simply laugh and joke with their family, spouse, friends, and neighbors and to pursue life and raise children. Achieving the fully just civilization is a meaningful goal for our mutual efforts. We are not there yet, but we human beings will not stop until this is the character of our civilization. We can safely predict that the characteristic of the last version of our government of people will be that its concerns fully match the concerns of life of individual persons, which are our children, spouse, family, friends, and community, not wealth, power, or war. We will then have built the core of our civilization and be able to put our mutual efforts to full use on anything we can imagine, even expanding into the galaxy. We, the human beings of the world, now direct our leaders to instead harness our mutual efforts to overcome today's lack of food, water, sanitation, housing, education, and health. The purpose of our mutual efforts is not to turn a handful of billionaires into trillionaires before they die. We now choose to glorify nurturing and kindness, not war, violence, or profit. For millions of years we have lived in a social group Exchanging assistance on tasks seem to be larger than one person can accomplish alone, because that makes life better for all of us. We human beings are nearly genetic clones who differ in personality. Our outer appearance is determined by about 30 out of the 25,000 genes that make a person. On to this, we tack a local culture, but you could take a newborn infant from any place on the planet, plop her among any people anywhere on the planet, and she will be right at home 
learning that local culture as our own. As we grow, we learn the local culture with fierce conviction and ridicule any person who imprecisely mimics the ways of the group. This might be the reason that we sometimes go so far as to insult the outsider. Do you believe that all Americans smell like the hamburgers that they eat? If you live in the U.S., do you feel insulted by this false statement? And have you ever said such a thing about the people of another nation? Such statements reveal only your ignorance of the people of the world. Laughing is one thing, but racism and bigotry fuel war and its atrocities. We don't want to go to war and suffer millions of deaths just because we think that they have funny ways. When people visit the U.S., they find it hilarious that pharmaceutical companies advertise on the television, telling you to tell your doctor which drug you should take. Visitors are surprised to see so many flags, not just on government buildings. By the way, only a few countries have a Pledge of Allegiance. Rather than imagining insulting characteristics for other people, it's a lot more fun to be among a group of 20 persons, each from a different region of the world, all celebrating life. Our mutual concern for our fellow human beings is all that we need to ensure our well-being. The universe is unimaginably large. Out of the entire universe, all we have is each other, here on this planet. As it is said, the best hope for humanity is a belief in humanity, along with mutual concern and respect. We, the human beings of the world, will stop teaching our children to think of and refer to people by the color of their skin. We will just stop stating skin color. Every human being agrees that the most beautiful thing in the universe is another person. The human in me greets the human in you. We human beings have demonstrated tremendous capability and accomplishment. Look at what we have accomplished in just the last few centuries. I have full confidence in our mutual efforts as we build our future together and head for the stars. In the early 1800s, as the Industrial Revolution was developing in England and Europe, in New England we were living in communities of single-family farms. A typical family lived in a small house located on their own farmland, not in town. Each farmhouse was within sight of those of a number of other families because the farmhouses were separated by the lanes of the farmland. You could see the candlelight of your neighbor's home from your own front door. Nylander explains that as you approached your neighbor's doorway, you would likely hear the whir of the spinning wheel and the thump of the butter churn. Nylander explains that in the evening, the family and guests gather around the snug fireside to sing play music, sew, knit, make buttons, whittle clothespins and such, repair harnesses or furnishings, and to listen while one person reads aloud from a book of fiction, poetry, dramatic plays, philosophy, theology, or even chemistry. Nylander explains that relatives and neighbors enter households freely in an active coming and going to share joys and sorrows and to offer assistance, advice, and support. The same girls who work together as adolescents spinning thread and husking corn will soon fit each other's wedding gown, run their own hospitable kitchens, encourage each other during labor, and have established places in the community. The community has its sages, high spirits, willing helpers, and busybodies. 
The household feeds any friend or relative who happens to be in the area at mealtime and will put them up for the night when overtaken by darkness or weather. Refreshments are given to any neighbor or stranger who walks by or asks for information or is chasing an errant animal or looking for berries to gather. Food in a bed is given to traveling peddlers and those who repair shoes, baskets, or tinware and such. They might sleep in the barn, by the fireplace, or even in bed with everyone else. In one week, a house might receive visits from brothers, aunts, cousins, cousins of cousins, and friends. Most would be fed and some would spend the night. A visiting woman might share the bed with the wife and husband of the house. Visitors often bring their sewing and such so that they can work while chatting and sharing news. A shopkeeper's home is especially busy. In one month, the household might make 100 extra meals and have 70 overnight guests who have come to conduct business and will join in whatever work is being done. Less visiting occurs during the busy spring and fall portions of the agricultural cycle. More visiting occurs when snow cover makes for easy travel by sleigh. Sleighs enable one to visit a home even 10 miles away and return the same evening. A full moon provides light into the evening, which is something that today's big city dwellers do not notice because of the bright street lights. Several sleighs full of people might travel together to drink at a tavern. Hawk explains that the farmhouse was not an isolated entity, but a focal point of the neighborhood, which extends outward in a radius of about one day's travel. The extended family members and their wards living in this area cooperate as a unit. A call for help from a faraway relative is answered. This unit performed all the functions that the medieval European village had done, including the care of sick, indigent, orphan, decrepit, and senile. In New England, it takes the combined efforts of many persons working all day long just to maintain the household. The well-working home was said to be a well-regulated home. A lone person cannot do all that is needed. When one woman becomes ill, the other women of the house must fill in for her by working extra hours and there is extra help from women of the neighboring homes. The same thing occurs when a man is ill. To repay for the knitting help done by a neighboring woman today, a man might go to her house tomorrow to chop wood. He will be fed while he is working there until evening. A woman might sew a shirt for a man who is helping thresh wheat at her house. Household women performed a variety of so-called earning work that could be exchanged for credit at stores or was done on a day labor basis within the community's web of exchanges. Nylander explains that people having rum drinks at a tavern might pay with potatoes, fish, turnips, butter, beef, veal, or pork. Here is a list of the payments received by Asa Talcott, who was a tailor and part-time farmer. Most every specialist was also a part-time farmer. We can imagine that some farmers knew that Talcott was fond of salmon and would give a higher value to it than would the miller. Talcott would exchange the received items and his own services and surplus food to the other people in the community and the tailor sometimes made clothing for motherless children. In big cities, actual cash is more often used. Shop owners indicate whether they accept the bartering of so-called country pay or if they accept cash only. Less than half of Talcott's tailoring work is spent making new clothes. Mostly, he repairs clothes to extend their usable lifetime. Farmers often bring cloth to the tailor to fit and cut, and then the farmer takes the pieces back home to sew themselves. 
the farmer contracted with the specialist in this so-called bespoke work. The same web of exchanges occurs among farmers, potters, butchers, millers, coopers, ministers, tanners, carpenters, lawyers, doctors, and other specialists. Each specialist is also a part-time farmer, hayer, sower, harvester, and maple syrup maker. Many specialties are seasonal. Those involving water mills cannot be done in the winter when the weather freezes water. The work of each family member contributes to the well-being of all. Most work provides food, clothing, heat, or light. The family is not self-sufficient in food and goods, but the entire village as a whole is nearly self-sufficient. Within the homes of the community, Mothers loan and borrow items and the labor of themselves and their children on a daily basis. Each mother knows the equipment and talents of every family. Nylander says that neighboring mothers trade the help of daughters just as they trade pots. Each woman keeps mental notions of exchange balances rather than written tallies. In the community system of exchange, New Englanders ask themselves, what labor and goods should we trade with which neighbors so that we, or they, can accomplish this or that? A child went to work young. Daniel Drake of Mazelik, Kentucky, described his childhood chores. At the age of eight, he rode on a horse to steady it while his father plowed. He planted seeds as his father covered them. He weeded. He stood guard over the crops by throwing rocks at squirrels and crows. He cared for stock, and he chopped and hauled wood. At eleven, he was given an old gun to scare pests from the field. At twelve, he held the plow and guided the horse himself. At thirteen, he split rails and built fences. By sixteen, he was doing a full man's work in the fields. Danielle's sister Lizzie, at the age of ten, was sent to a farm one mile away to watch over twins and their aged father for an entire week. She had complete charge of the house. She woke up at 5 o'clock in the morning, walked a distance to get water, made breakfast, and got the children ready for school. She then cleaned the dishes and began preparing dinner. New England was the only region of the U.S. having public elementary schools in the year 1800. There was one schoolhouse for every two to four square miles, which is three to six square kilometers. Some schools were funded from local taxes, while others were funded through the barter system. For example, a family might bring a load of wood for the school to use, or they might bring a load of something that the teacher could trade. In the 1840s, Horace Mann argued that universal education would guarantee the nation's political and economic stability and that it was a public matter for the public's good and should not remain a luxury of the elite. He said it would prepare informed and intelligent citizens and that in a republic, ignorance is a crime. We must prepare children to become good citizens, develop their capacities, enrich their minds, and imbue their hearts with the love of truth and duty. We agree with this today. We consider education to be an important part of being human and believe that no one should be denied an education. With each new thing that you learn or accomplish, you become a fuller person, a more complete citizen, and are then able to contribute more to the operation and progress of our mutual society. In the year 1709, people found how to make coke from coal. Coke produces enough heat to reduce iron ore, and with the growing industrial revolution, huge quantities of low-cost iron are produced for the first time and used for many things. In 1813, the cast iron plow began to replace the metal-covered wooden plow. John Deere introduced a steel plow in 1837 that was strong enough to turn tough prairie sod. Cast iron cooking and heating stoves appeared around the year 1820 and changed our cooking technique for the first time in a million years. 
It took a few decades for the use of iron stoves to spread across the nation. When one family was the first in their town to purchase a cooking stove, the other townspeople might warn that it would poison them all, but instead, within two years, most every family had stoves. One woman said that the first time she started a fire in her stove, it seemed like magic. Instead of turning meat on a stick placed over the fire, the iron cooking stove had top-side heating services placed at waist height. Heavy iron pots no longer had to be lifted into and out of the blazing hot flames of the fire. Since stoves used just one-third as much wood as did the open fireplace, less wood had to be chopped on the farm or purchased in the city. Cookbooks quickly appeared for this newfangled machine, just as they would 150 years later when microwave ovens first appeared. The preparation and cooking of foods has always been among humanity's most complex procedures. We humans first began full-time farming in ancient Mesopotamia about 10,000 years ago. Our subsequently invented cities required many new occupations, but usually 90% of us have been occupied as farmers. This was still a case for those of us in the United States in the year 1800, but increasingly less so with each successive decade. In the year 1800, 80% of us are full-time farmers, 95% are full or part-time farmers, 10% are self-employed artisans or shopkeepers, and another 10% of us are hired laborers. In the year 1900, only 40% are farmers and in the year 2000, only 1% are farmers. As we industrialized, the percentage of us living in urban areas would grow from 10% in the year 1800 to 40% in the year 1900. Each city had one dozen night watchmen working in pairs, watching for fires, and calling out on the hour that two of the clock and all is well. The twelve watchmen are the closest thing to a police force. The town's residents were the fire department. An alarm brought everyone out to quickly form a double line between the burning building and the nearest stream or well. Each household brought a fire bucket which was made of leather and might be marked with the family's name or initials. Water-filled buckets were passed along one of the two lines, and the empty buckets were passed back along the other line. When finished, everyone retrieved their bucket. Both the original purpose and manifestations of our social genes are demonstrated as the community pools efforts on chores deemed larger than one person can do alone. A large field is best cut and harvested on a singularly appropriate day. The help of many persons from the community is beneficial in accomplishing this chore and to do it in one day. The neighboring families combine efforts and the nearby town is emptied as its merchants close shop to join in the project. Haying is handled with the excitement of a battle. Lines of people with long-handled cysts work across the field. A slow cutter would, would receive friendly insults. Young men consider haying to be a physical challenge and a contest and strive to be considered the best mower or to be assigned head of a group. This work lasted 14 to 16 hours through the long summer day from dawn until dusk and even later during the bright light of a full moon. Cutting hay required the most work of all. Potatoes, oats, rye, corn, and wheat were harvested later in the year and did not require such a frantic rush as did haying. Threshing grain was done in the 10,000 year old labor intensive fashion. Harvested corn is stacked into a number of high piles. 
Neighboring families come to help remove the corn husk from each ear. Groups were assigned to each pile and then races would occur. Finding a lucky red ear meant pending courtship. Shucking corn was an occasion for celebration and every celebration involved heavy drinking and dancing. Alice Earle explains that after a heavy snow, community members used oxen-powered plows to push the snow off the roads. Everyone joined in to clear the roads because everyone needed to go to the school, church, post office, and town and be able to make social visits. Plowing began with those living farthest out of town. As they traveled inward, they were joined by others and their oxen. A tired ox would be left in someone's barn to be retrieved later. All raced toward the center of town where roads converged. There would be dozens of oxen and sleighs parked at the tavern. Community members would walk as far as 10 miles to meet at a homestead that needed trees to be cut down or needed rocks to be cleared from a field. Cut trees are left to dry for several months before everyone gathers again to drag away and pile up the logs. Accidents and injuries might occur while working as men would drink much rum. Everyone helped, including the Supreme Court Justice who lived in the area. Neighbors also worked the crop field of a sick person. People would meet to raise up a building, which might be a barn, church, or a school. They might break a bottle of rum over the central ridge pole. While we observe this modern day barn raising by an Amish community, we'll discuss the aspect of human nature that is the exchange of mutual assistance. We see that a few days help in harvesting might be traded for help in spinning thread, shucking corn, peeling apples, or tailoring a shirt. Some firewood or meat might be traded for the loan of a horse or wagon, or maybe for a few weeks pasturing of a cow. Neighboring families exchanged goods, utensils, and the help of themselves and their children. No money was paid in these help exchanges, but mental balances were kept. Neighbors exchanged help in doing many chores, but especially in those that were large or had to be done so quickly, such as in cutting the hay field. Soon after new families moved into a New England community, they were quickly entangled in the local system of exchanging goods and help. Everyone gave and received strength, time, and goodwill. The community was a social contract. These agricultural examples of mutual aid among neighbors is similar to those of other times and places. We saw that a group of Yoruba farming families might work one farmland at a time and that medieval European villagers might work the entire crop field as a community. In an example of our innate predisposition for mutual exchange, the Amish still prefer today to work together as a community, even using hand tools, rather than have one person work alone with a machine that it is said does the work of many persons but reduces communal ties. Do today's parents feel that family ties are reduced when children watch TV and play video games? Would you remove those devices to maintain strong family relations? Amish do. Amish are pro-family and community and avoid any technology that reduces those ties. Our biological ancestors first formed societies because they found it mutually beneficial to exchange assistance in any task that was larger than could be handled by one individual. That is the golden social rule. The original tasks were looking for food and watching for predators. A lone ancestor would not survive for long. <laughs>